The end is nigh. Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Professor James D. Tabor, he is now retired from Charlotte. Uh, is it Charlotte University, Dr. Tabor? University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I always Not Chapel University. Hill, where my friend Bart Ehrman is down the road. Right. But I'm in the largest urban center of North Carolina. Just so people know, you know, you've got a couple books here I have. I have the copies of. Really, really enjoyed this. I haven't read this one yet, but it is. Well, that's the book of Genesis, so you sort of read it, but you haven't read yeah. mine. Yeah, we're right. going to do it. We'll do a show on that because it, it'll be on translating the Bible, basically, and, and what, you know, Bart's done so much on textual variants. But once even you decide the variants, how are you going to translate? And Good this question. is the first edition of Genesis that has no theological language in it. So, mm. you know, words in, like atonement and salvation and all that sort of stuff. Because tries go to check out his Amazon page, please. Get you a copy of the books. And you've written a lot. You've had some New York Times uh, bestsellers, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the Jesus Dynasty, for sure. Yeah, that was a big one. Yeah, that was like Nightline 2020, cover of U.S. News and World Report. Uh, but it, you're not just, this, so. the one thing that I must say is like a lot of people who might make the New York Times, eh, you know, oftentimes it's not even a scholar who does it, right? It's oftentimes just a really good writer. But you actually have dug into this. You know what you're talking about when it comes to Paul. I've listened to you for hours. So check out the link in the description. Please get his book. Also, check out his blog. It's free. Go subscribe every time something new drops, upcoming stuff. In fact, he notified everybody about the upcoming tour that we're doing in Israel. And those who are on his blog are aware. They got the emails. Me and Neil from Gnostic Informant, we're going to Israel with Dr. James Table. We're going to look at the places where the graves where the seat, or I think it's the throne seat, the seat where the judgment call from Pontius Pilate would have taken yes, the place. the Praetorium. It's mentioned in the New Testament. The Praetorium is a specific place where the Roman governor or prefect of Judea makes official pronouncements, such as a death penalty for a prisoner. So, Go check and out his newsletter in the, in the sidebar. If you're on a phone, I think it's at the bottom, but there's a newsletter as well comes out monthly any anything you want to sign up for there's a lot there so go subscribe to his blog and also you want salvation subscribe to myth visions patreon i mean we work our butts off we are constantly bringing you new content and uh i've got a lot of stuff to edit videos i've done with you i think i have like 14 or 15 videos that we haven't edited to make public yet and i'm looking forward to making those public at some point but they will end up on Patreon first. And uh, once they go public, you know, they'll be on my channel. And for those who don't know, his YouTube channel. He has a YouTube channel. Man, this thing blew up pretty quick, Dr. Tabor. You've got well, 17,000. You've, you've been my inspiration because, uh, you know, I now that I'm retired, I'm going through everything I've done for these 30 plus years. 40 years, if you go back to, I taught at uh, Notre Dame, William and Mary and UNC Charlotte. And obviously I'm not putting up everything I've ever done because I've had just 
thousands of interviews and so forth, but I'm putting up things, even older things, but you know, what's amazing, Derek, hmm. probably the, just a little zoom thing I did on the Dead Sea Scroll Bible has half a million views. So, you know, it's not <laughs> professionally produced. Just me sitting at this desk talking about, oh, there's this book and this book. But, you know, people are hungry for reliable academic information. And uh, we're that one that's just now up. If you look uh, the that one right there, um, that's already got it hasn't even been up a day yet. And I think it has. What is that? 35 almost yeah, 4,000 like it's yeah. it's heading so and that was done in 206 it's a radio interview and uh but I think it's the best interview the best interviewer other than you Derek that I've ever dealt with she Liz Lane is just amazing you know interviewers are either good or bad really I mean they could be in the middle but a lot of them just don't know how to interview and Liz did, and you do, uh, meaning you let me talk. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Isn't that the goal? I mean, it is well, the goal. Also, that you've read the stuff. You got to, right. now today, we're not reading, we're not doing a book. We're doing the, let's call it the peril of harmonizing the Gospels. Even for a most ardent fundamentalist, I'm going to warn everybody that if you believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God, don't fall for the trap of harmonization because you're violating what God wanted to tell you by your worldview. You're actually destroying it. This harmonization of the gospels destroys the gospels, as you're going to see. Mm -hmm. And I've been teaching for 43 years. Lots of, I've had Catholic students at Notre Dame. I've William and Mary just average college students. And I've all, yeah, I'll leave that up a minute. I'll keep talking. I've also had uh, at UNC Charlotte, I mean, this is the South, we're the Bible Belt. Tends to be my students, you know, Christian backgrounds, they take my Christian origins course and my gospel course and my life of G historical Jesus course. And a lot of them are pretty conservative, you know, and we don't have any problem with one another because I show them a way to read the text that they can then process and gain from, even if they hold faith, presuppositions, approaches, convictions that I don't share. Because that's not what the class is about. So today, when we go through this, it doesn't matter if you think the whole thing is mythology or you know, with no historical value, or you think it's the word of God, this will be valuable for you to understand something maybe about the text. Hmm. I, and many of you might know some of this, but now here we have Kermit Zarley, my friend. I love Kermit Zarley. Look Just him up. He's him a up professional closer. golfer. And he was in the, you know, the PGA and some of the big golf tournaments. I think he's retired now. It's a wonderful Christian believer. And he wrote a book, what is that, 87, The Gospels Interwoven. And he sent me a copy. And I'll have to tell you a story. I read it. I looked at it. And what he's done, he's taken Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and put them all together. At the end, we're going to show you some slides of what he does. Don't do those yet. Uh, oh, I'm just showing book. the book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the book's fine. And uh, anyway... The idea is I'm going to create one gospel. Everything that's in all four will be in my book. And guess what? He's right. It is. And guess what else is true? <laughs> no Matthew, no Mark, no Luke, no John. You say, well, I thought you said everything was in there. But now they're like this. You see that? So where's Mark? Where's Matthew? Where's Luke? Where's John? It's become the Kermit Zarley gospel. So I had no had a kid with him. And I said, dear Kermit, I think I wrote him an email. And I said, you have destroyed the gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke no longer exist. And you've made a Kermit Zarley gospel. Thank you. But it's not what we as historians study. Now, I understand there's a use for that. I would suggest this. 
I uh, gotta see what you don't. I don't expect you to see this, but this is Gospel Parallels, Throckmorton. This is the synoptics. This is what I use in my classes. Look it up, Throckmorton. Uh, there's a new edition. This is my old one. Or really, I've started. I've started to use this one. This is American Bible Society. I like the Revised Standard Version. It's just a little more literal. This has John as well. So take a look. I open it up. Now, that is not a harmony. You see the difference? Mm. That is getting all three or four across the page where you can do your own comparisons. And for those of you who study Greek, and some of you do, you can get Huck, which is the version that Throckmorton translates. So this is English. This is Greek. And sometimes you do need to go to the Greek to see what sort of editing was done. You see right there. And guess what? The numbers of the pericopes in Huck are the same as Throckmorton. So if you're going to really go deep, here's the spine of the book where you can see and write it down. Synopsis of the first three Gospels. But I like the American Bible Society version. It's cheap. And why not throw John in? I think John knew Mark. And uh, I think he knew the other Gospels. So anyway. So, so what, are, what we're going to do is talk about why that enterprise of Kermit Zarley and others have tried this too. But Zarley does a really good job of destroying the Gospels. And I'm saying that in a friendly, facetious way because I love Kermit. And I think there's a use for what he does. But it's not a historical critical use. And we will show that right away. That's what I wanted to do is let everybody know that when we get going, I really, really want to let everybody know we'll get to your super chats after we get done with the presentation because I don't want to interrupt what you're doing. Um, it'll, it'll create a better question, I suspect, as well. So along the way, super chat them so you don't forget. And then when we get to the end, we'll get to your questions and have Q&A. But I'm excited about this as well. We had a diatessaron in history at one point. The church wanted to create a... Uh, mm -hmm. A unified message. They saw the problem. I think they saw the problem. Um, so, Kathy, thank you for so, finally like, getting uh, true salvation. Yesterday, Crossan, I'm taking off my watch. So don't worry about our time. <laughs> uh, let's just uh, let's get through the presentation. We've got 18 slides, and right. you'll get the bulk of it. And then any questions on the presentation and, hey, anything else in the universe? Okay, I, I'm I gonna... listened to Dom's uh, live yesterday. Oh my goodness! I love I was Dom. Riveted. Uh, I take a walk every morning, a two mile walk, and I finished it up this morning, uh, just as I was walking. And wow, just amazing! He is so. A fun are you ready to go, Derek? Should we just get going? I am. Yeah, let's do so, it. You're my students. Take some notes. Uh, if you know it, just check it off. Like I know that. I know that. I know that. So this is usually called the two source hypothesis. I don't I can't show anything with my cursor, can I? Because it's your screen share. No, and I don't think I can either. I don't think that, uh, we uh, won't worry about it. I'll just describe what's going on here. So if you look at the top with the two big boxes, that's where they get the word two sources, the idea of two sources. This goes back to the 1830s, a number of German and British scholars. Uh, let's start with Mark. The idea that Mark wrote first, uh, what we call the priority of Mark, it's a narrative account of the life of Jesus. Now, later, as we get into questions, let's talk about Mark and its provenance and when it was written and so forth. And here I agree with Crossan. I don't think it has anything to do with Peter or Rome or anything like that. I think it is a product of the land of Israel. And I think it's very Pauline, extremely Pauline. Mark knows Paul. And it's kind of a anti-gospel, as we're going to see. Derek and I are working on a Mark course where I'll give this in great detail. But anyway, just look at the chart. So the idea of the two sources, which, as you can see, is really six sources. You see the blocks? Count them. I don't see, I don't see two. I see six. So let's call it the six-source hypothesis, okay? makes more sense. Otherwise, it's confusing. But I'm calling it two source because that's how everybody refers to it. 
So the idea would be Mark wrote first and put together the Jesus story. Okay. Now notice the line going down from Mark. There's two lines. One goes to Luke. One goes to Matthew. The dates are arbitrary. If you notice, scholars just go, oh, 70, 85, 95. You see what they're doing? Let's jump decades. We have no idea. But all of them seem to be either right around or certainly after the destruction of Jerusalem. That's our only peg. So Mark writes, and according to this hypothesis, Matthew is rewritten Mark as far as the story goes, okay? In other words, he's got Mark, got a copy on his desk, and he's going, oh, we've got this story. But I've got a lot of things about the story of Mark that I want to change and alter. Some things I'm just going to take out because I don't particularly want to include them. I'm going to add some things as well to Mark. And I'm also going to add my own material that Mark doesn't even know. Now look over to the left of Matthew, the way I'm looking at the screen here. M. That's easy, Matthew. Matthew's own material. So everybody got that? So what is Matthew? Matthew is rewritten Mark's story plus his own material. But then we got, we have up at the top on the left, Q. I don't care if you call it Q. I'm going to call it in this presentation the, the saying source or even the double source because it turns out, here's a formal definition, that if you compare Matthew and Luke and you take out the material that they did not get from Mark, which should be easy to do, right? You can read Matthew and go, oh, that's from Mark. That's from Mark. I can actually take this book and go through and wherever there's two columns, like right there, I have it marked, see? Two columns, no mark, Luke and Matthew. I mean, this is just a fact, it's there. So go back to my screen, you follow? So we call that Q, Q just means Quella in German, a source. So I'm gonna call it the saying source. Turns out it's mainly the teachings of Jesus. It's a lot like the Gospel of Thomas, not entirely, but 95% of it. It's about 60 pericopes of Jesus just talking. By the way, this is a little footnote. Whenever that movie was made of, it's called the Jesus movie, and it claims to follow just the gospel of Luke, the one evangelicals use. It has Brian Deacon, I think, as Jesus. Do you remember that one? So famous. It's the most produced Jesus movie ever. And when they, because they did Luke, I haven't got to Luke yet, but it has all that Q sayings material. Nothing's happening. I'll show you that later. Like for nine chapters, nothing happens. And Luke just puts in Q, 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 Q. So what are you going to do if you're producing a movie? Because there's no action. He's just talking. Oh, they have him up, up a hill, down a hill, sitting on a rock, sitting by a river, walking, talking, trying to get that sayings material in in a movie. So it doesn't work. So back to Q or the saying source. Luke has that as well. Okay. And Luke uh, incorporates the Mark story. He has his own material and he has a lot of material, much more than Matthew. That's L. Okay. So Luke is rewritten Mark with the saying source put in and his own material. Matthew is rewritten Mark with the sags material put in and his own material. So that's the hypothesis. It's a little complex. I make my students remember this. Q or the sags material is the material that Matthew and Luke have in common that is not in Mark. Say that 20 times before you go to bed. Q, if you don't like people go, oh, I don't believe in Q. Well, do you believe there's a two source bulk of material that Matthew and Luke have in common. You have to believe that because if you open up your uh, synopsis of the Gospels, anytime there's two columns, no mark, we're calling that the saying source. Okay. And just so, so, gonna... just so you know, Dr. Tabor, I just want to mention, we're not even getting into the whole, 
you know, far debate. That's not even the point of this episode. Well, just so far people is useful. And that has to do with what about like Mark Goodacre would be the best spokesman for far today. Mm-hmm. And that isn't people say he's denying Q. He's not denying that there's material that Matthew and Luke have in common. That's not in Mark. Of course, he's not denying that because it's right there. What he's saying is, was it a separate document that circulated, that's kind of the Q idea. Mm-hmm. I don't really care if it was or not. What I'm going to show you in just a few minutes is that Luke has a version of it that is less edited than Matthew, in my view. And I think it'll become your view when you see what happens. So Mark wrote first the story. There is somehow a collection of the sayings of Jesus that Matthew and Luke incorporate, and then they both have their own material. So you see that? There's three components. So Matthew is rewritten Mark plus sayings plus his own stuff. Luke is rewritten Mark plus sayings plus his own stuff. That's the theory. 95% of scholars agree with this. That does not make it right. I'm going to show you now what makes it right. In other words, there's a reason they they agree. Dale Allison, Bart Ehrman, Paula Friedrichson, Dom Crossan. These are smart people. They all see this as a good working hypothesis. Here's why. See, people never look at the details. Here's why. Okay, slide two. Okay, this is where it's going to get tricky because if I do the slides, you won't be able to see it. Can you so, make it any bigger? Or maybe people can make their screen bigger on their computer. Ah, let me try this. So I did something. I zoomed it in. See if this is better. Yes. And I'll just scroll across. Yeah, you tell me better. to? I'll just go across. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Okay. That's perfect, Derek. Thank you. Uh, do you remember, uh, is his name DJ Wilkins in the chat yesterday? Yeah, he emailed me he, today. He was uh, asking yeah. about composite quotations. Yep. I didn't put this in for that, but it's very interesting to pick up on his point. Here you have the opening of Mark, and he says, "At his, I'm skipping the first verse for now, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and then he quotes Malachi. Whoa, <laughs> this is not good. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare the way. And then verse three, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Hmm, what are we going to do there? Then we got John the Baptist appears and how he looks and so forth. Okay, go over to Matthew. Here's the hypothesis. Matthew's rewriting Mark. Okay, I've got Mark. I'm going to rewrite it. So he says, uh, uh, verse three, for this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Wait a minute. Malachi disappeared. That's called rewritten Mark. He's correcting him. He does it a number of times. Now he puts, he likes the verse, but he went, he puts it in later. You go look it up. It's in Matthew later. He quotes Malachi, but he's not going to say, but notice how carefully he's rewriting Mark. Why didn't he say, as it is written in the prophet Malachi and Isaiah, and then leave it? That's not the way he works. He's actually sort of conservative. Do you see that? Yeah. Like Mark said, Isaiah. So I'll give you Isaiah. I won't give you Malachi. Now, let's have our imaginary but biblical inerrant person. And they're going to harmonize. Well, if you harmonize, you got to have both because Mark has Malachi. And you almost need to add Malachi, even though it's not there. But if we're harmonized, we cannot add to the word of God. So it's going to be kind of wrong. Because it's so, what are they doing? This is called composite quotations, which Wilkins was talking about. And he was picking up on the studies that you talked about yesterday. So, why are these so interesting? Because what they're doing, it's rabbinic. What connects those two? Go back. The way, prepare, okay, prepare the way, prepare the way. I got two verses, prepare the way. Isaiah talked about it. You see that? And so Mm -hmm. basically you connect them. Uh, But I just want you to see how Matthew corrects Mark and it does not go the other way. 
like there's no to me it's illogical to say matthew wrote first we got our matthew priority people and then mark is so stupid that he goes i'm going to rewrite matthew and i'm going to add a verse that's not even an isaiah which will be like wrong you see in other words it always goes the way of the correction so follow the correction or the or the shortening or the summary as we'll see next slide all right. Our next picture. I got to. Yeah, that's going to work me, good for you to just enlarge them, I think. That's what I'm going to do. I have to close each one and then boom. And we'll go as fast as we can because I know. So go back to uh, Mark is always on the left. So go to Mark. Okay. Here's the baptism of Jesus. Amazing. Notice how sh you can already see Matthew there in the picture. Do you see some stuff added? Or do you see some stuff taken away? You see the point? If Matthew yeah. wrote first, then Mark is giving a short version. Mm -hmm. Quick story. I'm a kid, 12 years old, got baptized in the churches of Christ. I'm going to read my New Testament. Got it? So I got read it. Matthew. I made it through Matthew. Wow, I'm, I'm a, such a good boy. And then I get to uh, Mark, second member, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And I go like, I've already read this. I read Matthew. I was a good boy. And now I'm reading Mark. Mark's just like a kind of a shortened praises, you know, like a summary of Matthew. But Matthew's the main thing, right? Wrong. I didn't know. Then if you get to Luke, it's like, well, this is kind of repeating Matthew. And I kind of read it, but there's other stuff. And then I get to John. This is wholly different. This is the experience of the average person reading the Gospels. But if you look at that, I don't like the word critically. Critically is okay, but most people think critically is like pick away, pick away. No, carefully. I tell my students, we're not reading critically, we're reading carefully. Big difference. You know, it has a different tone to it. Like if you ask anyone, should I read Mark and Matthew carefully? Absolutely. The most liberal scholar, Read it carefully. The most conservative scholar, read it carefully. Let's read it carefully. Well, let's read it. When Jesus is baptized, the heavens open, the spirit descends like a dove, a voice comes from heaven. Since you can highlight, you are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. Personal message to Jesus. You said, well, others could hear it. Not I. Mark is Mark. I'm just reading Mark. I don't know anybody else could hear it. I think it's a self-disclosure to Jesus. Now flip over to Matthew, move it over just a little bit. Oh, wait a minute. If Jesus is baptized and he's baptizing for the remission of sins, before I copy Mark, which I'm going to do, I better explain why he's even getting baptized because Mark doesn't even tell you that he's not a sinner. <laughs> so I got to have this little objection and then... Finally, he goes back. Heavens were open. You can see he's following Mark perfectly. Spirit descending like a dove. The Greek is word for word the same. And lo, a voice came. Whoa, wait a minute, Derek. Highlight that last verse. The voice. Oh, sorry. Sorry. This oh. is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Loudspeaker from heaven. Okay. back. Everybody to hears it. Our buddy Kermit. What is he going to do here? Remember, we want everything. We're going to create a new gospel. It's going to be a fifth gospel that we're going to make from these three. You see what's happening? Mm -hmm. If we put them together, I think the voice has to say to Jesus, you're my beloved son. He's my beloved son. <laughs> okay, what gospel says that? None. None of them. So you've created a gospel. Now, I want to read all of Mark as Mark. When, when people hear this course, it's going to blow them away because we're going to do just Mark. And later, Derek, let's do just Matthew, just Luke, and just John. Okay, this is the introduction. Now go to Luke. So Mark has an object. Look what Luke does. He doesn't even have the baptism of Jesus. Notice, first, Jesus is baptized and he, he's told by God who he is. Mark is like, Matthew's like, yeah, he was baptized, but it didn't really matter because he didn't need it. And Luke is like, 
when all the people were baptized and Jesus is baptized and was praying, you see, there's, I, I don't say he wasn't baptized. What I'm saying, he is baptized, but he's praying, meaning he's disassociating it from John. It's not like John had his hands on him and he got the big revelation, either the loudspeaker or the personal. This is more like, by the way, Jesus was baptized. John was baptizing people. Jesus is baptized. And, you know, once he was praying, well, it doesn't say he was praying. When was he praying? He also had been baptized. This could have been later up on a hillside by a rock. You see the point? Mm -hmm. So now he's getting the personal disclosure, according to Luke. Now, you can't harmonize that. If you put all three together, and I didn't put John, forget John for today, but John doesn't even have him baptized. He just says, the one on whom I saw the spirit descend, but it doesn't say when he was baptized, never mentions baptism. See what's happening? So we got to have all three. We got to take each one individually. Next slide. We're going to go as fast as we can because this could take a while. My courses are an hour and a half normally. Okay. Now, what do you see immediately here? Or what don't you see? No mark. Now, it's not because I didn't include it. It's because it doesn't exist. And you can kind of center this one a little bit where they can see both at once. It's word for word the same in Greek and in English. Yeah, there you go. And this is, shows you how consistent the two sources are without Mark. This is the saying stuff. It's got a little bit of narrative in it. It's got to have a little narrative. He can't just not say who's talking. So it introduces John. But notice if Luke begins, he's, he's talking to the multitudes and Matthew has him talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. So that's your first occurrence of the so-called two source very early on, and so both Matthew and Luke put it right after the baptism. It's part of John the Baptist preaching. Just want you to see that, where you can see how much they agree sometimes. They seem to be getting it maybe from each other, if that's possible. I think that would be the far hypothesis, or maybe there was a, a source external that they're relying upon. Okay, next. I shouldn't have told you how many slides they'll start counting them. <laughs> it's like my students do. Okay, here again, what do you see here? Two sources. Two sources. Uh, see if you can, well, let's just, uh, everybody know, this is Luke's blessings. Blessed are you poor. Yours is the kingdom. Blessed are you that hunger now. Blessed are you that weep now. Blessed are you when men hate you and exclude you and so forth. So basically, it's four blessings, the poor, uh, the hungry, the ones weeping, and the ones persecuted. You got that? Go over to Matthew. Matthew, I believe, is taking Luke and expanding it, and this is the version everybody knows, the so-called Beatitudes. But notice how it is quite a bit different. Blessed are you poor becomes poor in spirit. Uh, blessed are you that mourn, that could be about the same. Hunger and thirst is after righteousness now. See how it's being spiritualized more? Uh, and blessed are the You wonder if there's like some rich people behind this gospel going, yeah, I don't know could about be. this. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> uh, you're going to see. So here's the two sources again. Call it Q, call it whatever you want. I don't care what you call it. They're right there. You can read them. And you can see now they're different. I believe that Luke has priority in terms of following this two source. Now, he's written later, but I think one of his reasons for writing is he wanted to preserve more the original version of the two source that he had, and Matthew is adapting it. Now, I'll show you more examples of that. Go ahead. Next. And again, let me just add, if I put them all together, what have I got? It doesn't even make sense. Blessed are you poor. And also, if you're poor in spirit, <laughs> you're, you're good, too. Blessed right. are you. You see, it's just, you know, come on. Let's be real here. 
Okay. Hey, just just want to say thank you for the super chats. We are going to get to them at the end of this. We're going to get to them. Yes. I just go. new people are popping in. Yeah. New people are popping in. Don't, All right, don't leave, go. guys. Don't leave. <laughs> okay. Notice Luke though adds this, which Ma Matthew doesn't have. Remember, we had four blessings: rich, hunger, uh, mourning and weeping, and persecuted. And he does three woe. He does four woes. They exactly match the blessings. Was that in the original two source? Maybe, or Luke might have made it up. Who knows? But again, if you put all these together, like Kermit does, my good friend, who I care about and love. And he's a good guy. And I'm glad he did what he did, where I can talk about it. Uh, now, <laughs> where's Matthew? Where's Luke? You've lost it. You say, well, you got it. No, you don't. You've lost it. It's gone. You, have, you don't have that distinctive. Look at the power of Luke. Bless, 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 bless. Curse, 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 curse. It's got a real drumbeat to it, doesn't it? Did he do that? I don't know if he did it. Did his source do it? But it's very different from Matthew. Matthew rolls. It's liturgical. Matthew sounds like you'd say it in church. And guess what? If you've ever heard it quoted in church, I guarantee you've never heard Luke's version quoted. So it worked. It rolls off your tongue. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger. See, not making fun of him. I'm just saying it's different. Next. Derek's pretty good at this. I'm trying. Okay, my favorite. <laughs> Talk about the Lord's Prayer. Let's all say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on as it is in heaven. For thine is the kingdom and the power of the glory. <laughs> Look at Luke. When you pray, say, Father, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others and lead us not into temptation. Staccato, staccato, right? Four petitions. Go to Matthew. That's the liturgical version. Now, if you got a King James Bible, which I happen to have right here, look up Luke. You know what they did? The scribes of the King James, don't pull it up. You don't have to pull it up. It, just look on your own. They put Matthew's version of the prayer into Luke because people would be so disturbed. That's not the Lord's prayer. <laughs> I think this was the original wow. prayer. I think Matthew's expanding it. Now, if I put them together, what do I have? You see, the expanded version is always going to trump, to use a word that's been kind of changed in our culture today, it's going to trump or triumph over the short version because you're adding all the stuff. Just like the baptism scene. Luke doesn't have Jesus objecting. I mean, John objecting to Jesus being baptized, but Matthew does. So you see the additions are going to literally drown the original. So you don't get the original, if this is original. It's certainly original with Luke. Okay. By the way, thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever and ever. Amen. It's not even in the RSV or any modern translation because it is only in the late manuscripts. But do you see how liturgical that is? That's why people have remembered it. Nothing wrong with that. But why would you not want to notice the difference? I sort of like Luke's prayer. But anyway. By the way, I think John the Baptist taught this prayer to his disciples. That's what it mm. says in Luke. Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he goes, well, when you pray, say this. Okay. Interesting. Next. Okay. And by the way, Luke's prayer could be said in any synagogue today. Matthew's prayer could be said in any synagogue today. Talk about Jewish what is there about the Lord's Prayer that's Christian, the way people use the term? Now, this is my favorite. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Does that sound like John Kennedy? 
<laughs> you understand the rhythm I'm talking about? Yes. He cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It's called re rhetoric. Now, there's a voice here. Notice the yes, the rhetorical yes. Okay. Hate? I'm in Sunday school, third grade maybe. Teacher, did Jesus say we should hate our father, mother, brother, sister? No, Jimmy Dan, that was my name. No, Jimmy. He said we should love them less than God. Oh, I thought he said we had to hate them. Go to the next, go to Matthew. You think we had that problem in the modern world? They had the problem. Look what Matthew does. And as you cannot go from Matthew back to Luke, because Luke's the problem. Hate. I've heard people, I remember my Sunday school teacher went, well, hate in Greek doesn't mean hate. Miseo. Yes, it does. <laughs> what do you mean it does? What, they didn't have a word for hate? It means detest, hate, cast aside. It's called hyperbole. Now, does it mean love less? Probably. I agree with Matthew's interpretation. I think that's what it meant. But in Luke's original version, Jesus never lets up in cue. He hits you like this. You want to follow me? Hate your family. <laughs> Leave your family. Hate them. Go. You mean like love them less? Okay. He doesn't let you off the hook. You got to go figure that out. Now look at Matthew. This is the exact passage. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy. See, you've lost the rhetoric. You've lost the tone. You remember how I read the first one in Luke? It had that feel of an oral presentation. Is it from Jesus? Or is it the writer of the saying source having a more original version? I don't know who to credit it to, but it's rhetorical. This is not rhetorical. This is explanatory. If you read Luke and go to Matthew, it's like Matthew's going, this is what he meant. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. Luke is what he said. Sunday school answer, here's what he meant. Now you tell me the gospels are the same. Come on, they're not the same. He's telling you what it means, but he's not giving you what he, what he said. He's making it easy for you. And I think he's probably right. That's probably what it means. I mean, he doesn't mean you should detest your parents. One of the commandments is love your parents. Next. This one's even better. That's one of my favorites, but this is even better. You see why my students have fun? <laughs> <laughs> okay, a scribe came up and said, Teacher, I will no that there's I didn't know the order of them. Th this is good, but it wasn't what I was talking about. Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And another guy said, uh, I gotta bury my father. And he says, Follow me, let the dead bury their dead. More demands of following Jesus. Okay, look at Luke. I think Luke is original, by the way. Why did I switch these? Because I want you to see that that does not come out. See verse 61 that I highlighted in green? Mm -hmm. That doesn't come out as Q. You see why? Because it's the material they have in common. Well, 61 is not in Matthew. It's a third example. So did Luke just say, oh, I've got a third one. I'm going to add it. Just like he added those woes that Matthew doesn't have? I don't think so but it's open. So Luke has, well, I got to go home and tell my family bye. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. My theory is we would flip those around. Luke has three uh, questionings and Matthew goes, and he does this at least 10 times. He shortens it because it's like, have you got the point yet? You see the idea? Because if two guys come and they're both told, you know, uh, foxes have holes and I got to bury my father and so forth, why do you need a third? Okay, next. So once again, I think Matthew is editing the saying source. This is probably the one I was thinking. Yep, this is it. 
Now, you talk about rhetorical, Derek. I'm going to have you read this with your JFK voice. Go ahead. (laughs) Put your power in it. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, Uh, I tell you. No, pause. I'm going to teach you rhetoric. Say it again, but pause after your question. They got to think. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For henceforth in one house, there will be five divided, three against two, two against three. They will be divided. You just Father said, against... why are you repeating that? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against her mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. It's hard to read in one breath. It is. It's very <laughs> redundant. Like, I tell you, no division. They will be divided and they will be divided. He says, again, this is rhetoric. If I'm speaking as a public speaker, we naturally do this. I say, I'm going to drill home this point and I'm going to make it plain and I'm going to repeat it and I'm going to push it so you'll get it. I said, well, why didn't you just say you're going to really make your point? Because I want you to feel the rhetoric. Okay. Now, what did that mean? Matthew is the cliff notes. <laughs> Go over. What did, what did Jesus just say? Luke is what he said. Matthew's like, what did he mean? Do not think. Not, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Do you think? No. I'm, I'm cutting to the chase. Don't think I've come to bring peace. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be those of his household. Do I need to name every other relationship in the family until I'm out of breath? No, you got the point. See? See what he's doing? Mm. Now, who's editing whom? You know, if you think Matthew is prior, then you're going to go, oh, Luke, boy, he turns this dry kind of explanatory stuff into this powerful rhetoric. Maybe, but wait, because I'll show you that it definitely is not going that direction. Luke is preserving a more original version, whether it goes to Jesus or not is a question, but that's not what we're talking about. You see the idea, though? Matthew is always shortening it and telling you what the point is. Luke is giving you the saying, and you got to figure out the point. There's Luke as a big question mark. Okay, next. Okay, that was all the two source stuff. Now let's do Mark. I think Mark is next. There might be one more. No, there's one more of those. Okay, just the part that I have highlighted because we, we want to move ahead. I tell you, my friends, this is Luke. Do not fear those who kill the body. And after that, no more have no more that they can do but i will warn you whom to fear fear him who after he's killed has power to cast into hell that's gehenna yes i tell you fear him hear the rhetoric you already said fear him why are you saying at the end yes i tell you fear him now you say to me derek what did he just say go over to matthew it's almost comical He said, don't fear those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy soul and body in hell. (laughs) You see? That's what he said. Well, that is what he said, but it's not what he said said. It's what he meant said. So you see what's happening? Mm -hmm. Now, did you notice all four of those examples, the same process is going on? Shorten, abbreviate, summarize, soften the blow. What does hate mean? Well, don't even use hate. Just say it it means love less than God. Well, go ahead and interpret it. Okay, so Luke is raw sayings. Matthew's interpreted theologically. It's not bad. Every Sunday school teacher does Matthew, whether they're conscious of it or not. What did he mean by that? Okay, next. I think we're finally going to get to Mark And we'll be able to wind this up pretty quick. Whoa, these are thick. 
Now, <laughs> this is a story. Don't look at Matthew. You're going to have to go to Mark. And are you able to stretch Mark at all? We're um, just going to have to describe this to people. You want me to like zoom in more? Yeah, on Mark, though. I'm not going to read it all. Yeah, pull over. Yeah, you can see how long it is. You look it up and and you'll have the recording of this, all of you, and you can look it up yourself. Anyway, I'm not going to read it all, but it's basically a very elaborate story about a paralyzed guy. They're in Capernaum. Uh, they take the roof off the room where Jesus is because it's so crowded. They can't get into him. They remove the roof. It's like a thatch roof with mud. We show you examples of that when we go to Israel. They let the guy down on a pallet. It even says, I think it even maybe says how many men. I'm not sure. Anyway, the whole controversy is how can he forgive sins? Because Jesus says your sins are forgiven. How can he forgive sins? Is he claiming to be God? And then go on down. You see how long Mark is? I want you to mainly see the link so you can zoom back out again. Zoom back out where they can see the link. The length. Now, Luke doesn't matter here because he follows Mark almost. Visually, can you see what I'm saying here? That Luke is basically keeping Mark. He's conservative. If he doesn't have a problem with Mark, he just puts it all in. Now, look at Matthew. Remember we said Matthew shortens, abbreviates, and it's almost like Matthew's saying, get to the point. Get to the point. Well, what's the point? The point is not like how the guy got there. Did they take off the roof? Was it hard? Nothing. It's just like, look, let me read it to you. And behold, they brought to him a paralytic. <laughs> what? Like no circumstances? Yeah. What is he on the road or what? It doesn't even say they're in a house. Take, son, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Oh, how can he forgive sins? Well, I can say, rise up and walk, that you may know the Son of Man has authority, forgive sins, take up your bed and walk. He rose and went home. Totally, totally different story and totally the same story. Why? Because for Matthew, the point is Jesus has the authority to forgive sins and heal. Well, that's also Mark's point. But for Matthew, he doesn't need all that details because he just wants to slam home the point. We saw him do it with the two source, too. He does the same thing. Next. Okay. This is my favorite of the comparisons. Picking grain on the Sabbath. This is dynamite. Again, it's small print, so I'm going to summarize it. You can make Mark a little bigger and move it over maybe just a little bit where they can see it. Many people will know this story. One Sabbath, they're going through the grain fields. They begin pluck ears of grain. We won't talk about how is that a violation of Jewish law or is it or whatever. Anyway, uh, and the Pharisees accused Jesus. Why are your disciples doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? That is work, threshing, right? Or not preparing your meal ahead, which you're also supposed to do. And he goes, well, uh, you hadn't read about David. He was hungry and we're hungry. And he entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest. By the way, Abathar wasn't high priest. It was Abimelech. But hold that. Kind of <laughs> like Malachi and Isaiah. And he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. If you go back and look in the Torah, it's a severe penalty for eating the bread of the presence. You're going to be cut off from the people. Only priests can eat that. David's not a priest. He goes in and eats it and gives it to his men running from Saul. And uh, then he said, the Sabbath was made for humans. I'm going to say humans, not man. Not humans for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Let me paraphrase Mark in my own words. Laws are for people. People aren't for laws. So you need to decide if you have a law like keep the Sabbath, what does that mean? Just keep in mind it's for human good. God didn't create the law and then make a world. He created a world and then gave teachings. 
That's called situational ethics, Derek. You're well familiar with it, mm -hmm. right? Anne Frank is in the attic. The Nazis are knocking on the door. The neighbors said you had Jews hidden in your attic. Oh, yes, I cannot tell a lie. They're upstairs. Sorry, I'm an honest person. Or do you say, what are you talking about? I don't even like Jews. I would never even let a Jew in my house. You got the wrong house. Did Is that okay to lie? I would. I'd say it's not only okay, it's ethically required of you to lie. Okay. This is not that extreme. But what he's saying is, judge a law by the situation. Go over to Matthew. Matthew changes this. And this really bothers Matthew. Because if you leave, by the way, <laughs> notice it. Go to, all the way to the bottom. All right. Go all the way to the bottom. Uh, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Wait a minute. Verse 8. I thought he said laws are for people. People aren't for laws. Oh, that's gone now. And now let's change the meaning of the whole thing. Why was it okay for Jesus and his disciples to eat the grain picked on the Sabbath. And if you read Matthew, you know what the answer is? It's not that laws are for people. It's because of who Jesus was. So what does he add? He has the David thing. It's basically like David broke the law, so I'm breaking the law. Go figure that out. That's Mark. Sorry to create a problem, but you know if you have any spirituality, you'll probably figure it out. Why did, but he did break the law. David broke the law and he was okay. Okay. Now look what Matthew does. He has David breaking the law, but then verse five, look at verse five, highlight that verse five. Or, or have you not read in the law how the Sab on the Sabbath, the priest of the temple profane the Sabbath? Mark doesn't have that. Matthew's adding it. This is rewritten Mark. So what is he saying? He says, I got a better reason. I know you had your reason, but that's a little dangerous. You're going to have people deciding how to keep the law on their own. Do you really want that? I think the real reason was how great Jesus is. I'm going to ask you, why can the priests work hard on the Sabbath? Because they're serving the temple. So it's allowed. Well, I'm greater than the temple. So they're allowed to serve me. The whole pericope switches. You see that? It yep. switches from laws are for people, people aren't for laws, to Jesus is greater than the temple, so he can do ever what he damn wants to do because he's basically God or certainly the son of God. You see the idea? Yeah. Now, could you go from Matthew to Mark? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, you can make that argument, but it doesn't work for me. Uh, Luke actually, uh, go ahead with Luke. He also has a problem. He, he doesn't add the temple stuff and all that. That's too much. He's not going to add that. And I think Luke has Matthew. Matthew wrote first. I think Luke sees, says, yeah, I saw what Matthew did. I'm not going to go that far, but I do like that Lord of the Sabbath thing. And I am going to take out that laws are for people. People aren't for laws. I'm paraphrasing. You get my point. I'm taking that thing out because I don't know. You let people decide their own ethics, boy, you could end up with some real problems. Mark is like, fine. It's kind of like Paul. Mark is a lot like Paul. Do you remember some of Paul's things mm -hmm. where he would say, uh, he would quote something really radical and then the Corinthians would go too far with it and he'd go like, oh yeah, I said that, but like, I didn't mean that, you know, like, Eat what is set before you, asking no questions. And then they're going to the pagan temple, eating sacrifices to Athena. And he goes, oh, well, yeah, generally you can, but don't go to the temple and do it and sit at the table because that's, there could be a demon there or something, you see? So it's sort of like that. It's like Mark is dangerous. He Paul is dangerous, meaning... Paul figures if you have the spirit, you'll figure it out, right? Okay, next. Now, by the way, Derek, we always want to remember, what if we try to harmonize those three? Whoa. 
First of all, it won't even make any sense. <laughs> Secondly, Matthew will triumph because he's added stuff that changes everything. So that's going to take precedence. Oh, this is a great one. I say they're all my favorites. I guess they're all my favorites. Peter confesses Jesus finally. Uh, I meant to put Mark first. Go over to Mark first. Um, who, do you, who do people say that I am? Verse 29, Peter says, you're the Christ. He charged them to tell no one. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer and so forth. Uh, verse 32, he said this plainly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. And turning to his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Okay, go back to Matthew. Okay, Matthew has all that, but before that, he puts a blessing on Peter. Now, that's a look. Look, if you just read Mark, Peter has no idea what it means to be the Christ. He totally misunderstands, as the disciples do all through Mark. The disciples never understand. But Matthew's like, but yeah, later, didn't Peter become kind of the foundation of the whole 12 and so forth? And even though James is the leader, he's head of the 12. So he's also blessed, right? So I'm going to put that in so that people, I'm going to put the rebuke. You know, he's not going to take out the rebuke. So he doesn't take out the rebuke. Uh, if you go on reading, it does have the rebuke. But if you bless the guy before you rebuke him, you see what it does to the flow of the passage. Once again, what direction does it go? We always start with the problem, and then you get the softened version. So Matthew's the softened version. Next, we're almost done. And then we can do your super chats or any kind of questions on the universe, for that matter. <laughs> ah, this is a good one. And we don't even have to read this much. It's just funny, really. Uh, there are three predictions of Jesus' suffering. Three times the disciples misunderstand. And three times Jesus teaches them about following. Take up your cross. I'm going to suffer. Mark 8, Mark 9, Mark 10. Matthew has to rewrite that. You already saw what he did with Peter being rebuked. Oh, yeah, but he blessed him too. Okay, maybe, but not in Mark. He doesn't bless him, never blesses him. Okay, what does Matthew do? Go ahead. Oh, two disciples come up. I'm sorry, sons of Zebedee and Mark. We didn't. I didn't even point that out. And their misunderstanding is, uh, he's been talking about suffering right before. Like, I'm going to die and bleed, and they're going to spit on me, and the, you know, I'm going to be crucified. And they go like, we had a question, master. Could like my brother and I be like on your right and left hand in the kingdom? Like, I know you're going to suffer, but like when we get to the power and glory, I just want to check ahead. <laughs> you see, Mark is making you laugh at him, not laugh, but like cry probably. He's, you know, like, oh my God. Okay. Look at Matthew. The mother comes and asks, the Jewish mother. Oh, so they didn't really fail. It was the ambitious mother wanting to put her sons forward. Now, if I harmonize, then it's the mother. And then when the mother asks, they chime in and go, yeah, yeah, we want to be first and second. <laughs> you see that? Yeah. Now, I didn't put Luke in. You know why? He just takes the whole thing out. <laughs> Luke is hilarious. He's just like, I'm not dealing with any failure out he doesn't even have the story but it's in his mark now if he only did it once that's fine but luke does it every time every time he takes it out do you think he has the rebuke of peter i didn't mention that jesus rebukes peter you think luke has that not there look it up in luke okay next and this is why we think mark is has priority, wrote first. Okay, this is this is amazing. The great commandment in Mark 12, Hero is the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself is the second. Notice this is a scribe who answers well 
who says when Jesus is asked, what is the great commandment? He says, you are right, teacher. Look at verse 32. You are right, teacher. If you could highlight that for people. You've truly said that he is one. God is one. There's no other. Love him with all the heart, all the understanding, all the strength. Love one's neighbor as yourself. It's much more than all burnt, whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any question. This is the only guy commended in the entire gospel of Mark for understanding what the kingdom is all about. Remember in Mark, the kingdom's a secret, right? He tells the disciples, for you is revealed the secret, but they never got it. He gets exasperated with them explaining it. Now, this scribe is good. This scribe stands out as having the most spiritual insight of anyone in the gospel. Matthew does not like Pharisees and scribes. <laughs> Go over to Matthew. By the way, Luke just takes it out. He goes, I'm, I'm not going there, you guys. <laughs> Jerry. Think, remember, Luke's already seen what Mark does and what Matthew does, and he's like, you guys have your little cat fight. I got other things on my plate to get across, like the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son and other things. Okay, notice this is bad. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fault Matthew for that. This is bad. If he's looking at Mark and turns it into this, that's bad. Please, Kermit, don't harmonize this because notice you're making the guy bad. And one of them, a lawyer, ask him a question to test him. It's not a sincere guy with wisdom. This is a guy that just wants to trip Jesus up. And then as soon as Jesus makes his big declaration, whoa, I can't even say anything. No one dared ask a question. Now, is that different or not, Derek? That I mean, is, that very is really different. And to tell somebody you're not far from the kingdom because you realize that the temple is not even needed because it's a den of thieves, which means shredding animals, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer for all people. And you got the court of the Gentiles and the court of this and the court of the women and the court of the men. And, you know, it's segregation, segregation, segregation. And then the priests and then the high priests. It's supposed to be a house of prayer for all people. So anyway, uh, Mark, remember, Mark writes after 70 AD. So Mark's version you don't need the temple anymore to serve the one God of Israel. That's the most important verse in Mark. That's actually, that pericope, if you change that as Matthew does and don't commend the guy and tell why he's wise, you know, why he sees it, why when he, when he answers, because he's the guy that goes, like a light goes on in his head. Oh my God, if that's true, then we don't even need this temple anymore. And Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom. So now what is the kingdom? The rule of God on earth, right? As it is in heaven with all human beings, our father. It's not Jewish. It's not Israelite. It's the kingdom that fills the earth. Next. So that's a biggie, Derek. Mm -hmm. And I think we're getting to the end now. Maybe two more. Okay, this is quick. Have you ever seen a longer account of Gethsemane than Mark 14, 32 through 42? 10 verses, 11 verses? Wow. Three times he says, please stay awake. Please stay awake. I need you. Stick with me. Don't fall asleep. Three times they fall asleep. And finally, verse 42. Get up. The betrayer's here. Look at Luke. Go ahead to Luke. Now, here I'm not doing Matthew. You can read Matthew yourself because I want to make the point about Luke now that Luke removes the failure of the disciples. I alluded to it, but I want to give you an example. Yes, they do fall asleep. And he, but notice he only prays once. And then he gets up and finds him sleeping. And he goes, why are you sleeping and I think Matthew says they're sleeping for sorrow. I believe it, that's Matthew that says that. 
So Matthew, again, is Mark is presenting a pretty stark story, you know, of the failure. And look what it becomes in Luke. And uh, I didn't put in Matthew because you've already hit on Matthew enough. And finally, I think we're getting maybe to the empty tomb. Is that the next? Is that the last one? I think we're real close to the last. Yes. Yes. You want me to go ahead and go there? Yep. Okay. By the way, Luke takes out, they all forsook him and fled. I didn't put that in. You know, the verse, shortest (laughs) verse in Mark, they all forsook him and fled. It's not there. So it doesn't even say the disciples ran away. And also Luke takes out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what, that's the only thing Jesus says in Mark. Takes it out. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He adds that. Okay. Sabbath is past. Mary Magdalene and Mary come to the tomb with James, uh, Mary, mother of James and Salome. I think that's maybe Jesus' sister. They're going to anoint Jesus. The tomb is empty. There's a young man inside, verse 5. He's sitting on the right side of the tomb. He's in a white robe. They're amazed. They're told he's risen. He's not here. See the place where he, where they laid him. Go tell his disciples he's going to meet you in Galilee. They went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had come upon them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Curtain down, marks over. So your last view of Jesus, the purpose of the empty tomb is you're never going to see Jesus again on earth. He's gone. Your last view of Jesus is a dead Jew crucified on the cross, crying out with his last words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if you look at Matthew, it's the glory hallelujah ending. That's not a glory hallelujah ending. That is kind of like, Wow, he's gone. And what do we do now? Well, go back and read Mark. You could do things like sell what you have, take up the cross, right? Give up all you have and so forth. Okay, Matthew 28. We've got an earthquake. Wow. Angel of the Lord comes. His appearance is like lightning. (laughs) Matthew did not sit well with Mark's ending. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Not only does he have people raised when Jesus dies running around, right? Appearing. This has got to be cosmic. You're just going to have a guy dead saying God has forsaken him and that's the last view. That's worse than the Lone Ranger riding off and you go, who was that man? You know, I mean, this is like, you don't even get to see him. But I absolutely agree with Don Crossan. It's apotheosis is sent to heaven. They're going to see him in Galilee on the mountain, as Matthew even says. Matthew knows this tradition. Uh, But here in Matthew, angel of the Lord, appearance like lightning, his raiment white as snow. The guards tremble. Remember, the tomb has been sealed and guarded. The angel says, don't be afraid. They go in quickly. Uh, Let's see. Doesn't it say, trying to remember here, I'm looking at this small print. Maybe it's Luke. Who says that there were two people, two angels in the tomb? Maybe that's Luke. It might have been Luke. Yeah, Luke. But anyway, you see the difference, dramatic difference. A young man sitting in the tomb versus this huge uh, thing. And, of course, Matthew has appearances and so forth up in the Galilee on the mountain. Okay, that's it, Derek. Uh, let me summarize real quickly. I, I do want to say just, just what's interesting yeah, about this before I exit this is, like, the women went and told no one, for they were afraid. And in here, it's like, you know, they go and tell them. They go and tell the, the, the exactly. disciples quickly. Yeah. It's like, yeah, he's not going to leave it there. Uh, yeah. As I told you when we filmed the Mark course, picture it like a play and the last thing you've seen is jesus and the curtain goes down and he's dead then the curtain goes up and it's sunday morning and you see the tomb and the stones away and there's a guy inside you can see the guy inside picture like a play on a stage 
and they run up and all that. And then they're told he's not here. He's risen. You're going to see him in Galilee. They run away. And then the curtain goes down. See how dramatic that would be? Yeah. yeah. Very different then. Now, I said several times, Mark is Paul. I don't mean Paul wrote Mark. Right. Mark would say what really matters. Truly, this man was the son of God. Centurion confessing him. He's dead. He's dead. This dead guy is the son of God, meaning you need to take up a cross, follow him. And if you want power, position, glory, all of that, like the disciples did, you're missing the point. And what does Paul combat constantly in his letters? The Corinthians already are you kings without us? You know, have you become powerful judging one another, wanting to decide who's the greatest? You know, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of this. And what's the main message? The Messiah crucified, suffering, the suffering servant, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 42, and so forth. So what does Matthew do typically? He shortens, he abbreviates, he summarizes he in interprets of, for he, you for you and he expands like crazy if he feels something is not to his liking or his presentation and he sometimes will completely change a story like the wise scribe and not even tell you he had the greatest insight of anybody Jesus ever dealt with according to mark he vindicates the 12 yeah, he vindicates the 12. He has some of the, you know, he, he'll say things like, and on the way they ask, Mark says, on the way they're talking about who's the greatest. So Mark's like, oh, while well, he was talking about suffering, they're going, you guys, when we get back to Jerusalem, do you think, like, who's going to be on the right and left hand? You know, they're talking like this. And he basically, as I recall, Matthew says, and when they got in the house, they ask him, who is the greatest? Not like they were talking about it where he rebukes them, but more like we were just wondering, you know, anyway. <laughs> so uh, the uh, trying to remember um, Luke takes out the widow's might thing, too, which is interesting. But that's another doesn't story. Luke Luke downplays the family. Luke acts really tries to downplay Jesus's family. Uh, I, I, I would say so to some degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's now, a lot. So he shortens, he abbreviates. And I think the direction is always Mark first priority. So I would agree with Streeter and Schleimacher and the ones who first proposed in the 1830s, Mark and priority. I think there was this uh, two source tradition of the sayings of Jesus. And even when you look at those, what is characteristic of Matthew to shorten to edit, to get to the point, to summarize. And that's what he does with Mark as well, his source. I used to play a game with my kids when they were growing up, eight, nine, 10, and they would just laugh their heads off. They would say like, okay, dad, we're gonna read you a verse from one of the gospels. You have to tell us which one. I, told, I set it up. I said, you know, you guys, I know the Bible pretty well. Read me any verse. And they don't even, you know, they don't know. They're just opening it random. 90% of the time I could get it because I would recognize these things. Right. <laughs> it wasn't because I had it memorized. So I tell my students in the Gospels course, by the end of the course, you got a pretty good chance of winning at that game, way over 50%. Because chances are they're going to read something. Like, they all forsook him and fled. And you'll be like, Mark. <laughs> you know, it's like, you just know. So it's not. And also, have you ever noticed, Derek, at the end of each gospel, you get the meaning of the gospel? Hmm. Look, Mark, mystery man crucified. Oh, my God, I'm afraid and trembling. Would I have to do that to follow Jesus, who is the son of God? I don't know. Matthew, glory, power, authority is given to me. Go into all the nations, preach, teach, baptize. What is Matthew about? Jesus is the Messiah. 
He's the new Moses. Teach, baptize people into his Torah faith, right? Last verse. Luke, repentance and remission of sins will be preached to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem and so forth. And then you go to Acts, and that's what you have with the mission of Paul. So they all give it away at the end, you know, what, what they're really all about. Right. And I know it sounds like I'm fault. I do prefer Mark. There's no question. But I'm not saying I prefer him theologically. Right. I we just, talked about that in your course. Yeah. yeah, I kind of prefer the original version before someone came along and rewrote it because I'd like to hear the power of the, of the first story told. And if you have another story to tell, fine. And for your time, maybe it was needed, you know, by Matthew or Luke or it's serving their community in some way. But to say that they're all the same, and now you see the transgression, I won't use the word sin, but the terrible mistake to do this because you just lost them all. And the one who will gain will be the one who changed and added the most. Right? Because you're going to put it all in. Mm. Now, we don't have time. Don't I was going to put up a couple of Kermit Zarley slides, but yeah, well, can you can find them on you can go to Amazon and you know how you look inside a book. Type in empty tomb and it'll let you look ahead of time. And what he does, clearly he can't harmonize all that. So he calls it the gospels interwoven, not harmonized, interwoven. But if he has to constantly put little notes in to say, well, Mark has an, a young man and Matthew has, you know, a, a powerful angel that knocks him dead with his glory. Ooh, that is different. But then who's sitting inside the tomb and so forth? You know, that part is different. So uh, I keep thinking, do you mind if I look? I keep thinking that there were two men in the tomb. In Mark? Mark? In Matthew. You're talking about Matthew. Okay, you keep, yeah, you keep going I had the to angel, that. but I thought he also said there are two men. And see, that would be a real problem, because if there's one guy, how are you going to have two guys? While you look at that, I'm just going to give a shout out to a couple, and then I'll pull up our yeah, first let's do some questions. Kathy, welcome to True Salvation and Myth Vision. Thank you for becoming a member, and I really appreciate you being here today. I hope everybody is enjoying what they're hearing and this will spark more curiosity to dive in. But yes, thank you for being a member. And for those of you who don't know, if you become a member, I give early access the same way I do with Patreon. I'm giving early access and like posting the URL links to a lot of these interviews that are never been made public from Elaine Pagels, John J. Collins, Joel Baden, um, you name it, people that I've done in person. In fact, even stuff that I've done with you, James, um, we are, uh, we are getting that on Patreon, and I will make sure that that stuff is going to get onto the membership side. Okay. So the Sage two men two, the two okay. men in dazzling apparel are Luke. So young uh, man, powerful angel from heaven, earthquake, and two men. So again, you see, what, what is it? So he yeah. can't put them all because that would be crazy. There was a young man, but also two men, and then there was an, you know, come on. So... <laughs> You know, mm. read them as they are and let them tell their story. Think of it as three movies or three paintings or something like that. Norman okay. Rockwell is not the same as uh, an, a Picasso, right? But are you saying, like, you hate Norman Rockwell because of Picasso or vice versa? Maybe some people do, but you know what I mean? They're, yeah. they're doing their own presentation okay read me dr see. tabor what is your evidence for the first disciples not proclaiming the resurrection immediately after jesus death well i think uh this is sages and pages uh thanks for the question well they did proclaim it mark doesn't have them proclaim it but they do say you will see him and certainly mark knows that the gospel went forth. Uh, he, verse 
first verse says the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. And so they did proclaim him, but not according to the gospel of Peter, not for a week or so. Uh, you've got the days of unleavened bread. That's eight days, seven days plus Passover, eight days. And the gospel of Peter says, kind of goes with Mark. They found the tomb empty. Then they wept and cried for seven days. And then Peter said, I'm going fishing. And they went up to the Galilee. And then they had their visionary experiences. And then they did, I think, proclaim the resurrection. There I would go with Paul's earliest testimony, 1 Corinthians 15, that he apparently received from Peter, from James, from others, that they had appearances. But I think the early tradition is these were in Galilee, not in Jerusalem. After all, would Mark say, you will see him in Galilee and also you'll see him uh, later today. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't make sense. So. There, it's two different traditions. It has to do with the Galilee tradition of the movement and the Jerusalem Judean tradition of the movement. That's something we didn't even get into about how the yeah. Gospels do yeah. different. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. How do you harmonize yeah. that? I think um, Crossan talked about some of that yesterday. And the other thing, Luke is or Luke is the one who has the most Jerusalem appearances. But guess what he says? This is kind of a problem. Jesus tells them not to leave Jerusalem until Shavuot or Pentecost. Well, that's 50 days later. And he says, don't leave the city. Well, how are they going to see him in the Galilee if they don't leave the city? So he's, and he doesn't even have any Galilee appearances. John comes along and says, whoops. Yeah, they had stuff in Jerusalem, but then they did leave the city. And when they were up fishing, they saw him in the Galilee. And so he puts on chapter 21 and he kind of, he realizes there's some problem here. We better put them both together. But I think uh, resurrection is a misnomer here. I really agree with when Paul talks about resurrection in first Corinthians 15, it's raised to be transformed into this glorious state. And anybody that's followed my stuff knows I talk about it constantly and I won't go into any detail here. It's all over my YouTube, my interviews with Derek. Um, so I think uh, the, the awakening of faith was in the Galilee and probably certainly Peter seems to have seen him first and James and the 12 and the 500 brethren and all the apostles and so forth. They begin to have these experiences of seeing Jesus and finally Paul. And Paul equates and compares his experience. Have I not seen the Lord? First Corinthians 9, First Corinthians 15. And so that would be how I would explain it. Thank you so much. Gnostic informant Neil, if you haven't subscribed to his channel, you're probably going to cook in an eternal conscious torment, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and give you the opportunity before we end up cooking you. Is that like purgatory? They get purgatory or did they got, they can. It's something like that. If they do know, it today. No purgatory either. Exactly. Uh, Neil, thank you for the super chat. Gnostic informant says, we oftentimes hear that each gospel is directed at a specific group of people. Is this true? If so, who the groups of people that the, who are the groups of people that the four gospels are directed at? Oh, uh, endless discussions among scholars, as you would expect, and endless disagreement, as you would expect. But um, essentially, it would be not so much name groups, but stages of the development of the Jesus movement. I think chronology really helps here. I believe Mark's story that we just summarized and talked about does represent a kind of Pauline anti-gospel. And by anti-gospel, I mean any of those that are thinking following Jesus is glory, hallelujah, in power and taking over all kinds of uh, positions of rulership, 
which Jesus warned against. And in Mark, he's concerned that that's what they're really interested in. Uh, Paul talks about that as well when he talks about his sufferings. Remember, I wrote the book, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, which has to do with his ascent to the third heaven and into paradise. But then he compare, he talks about his sufferings. Romans 8 will be glorified if we suffer. So I think Mark is concerned that people are putting the glory before the suffering. Matthew is from a different period. Jerusalem is long ago destroyed. There's still some apocalyptic expectation. But when he gives the apocalypse in Matthew 24, he adds three stories of delay. Take a look. They're not in Mark. Three stories of delay right in a row. Bang, bang, bang. That cannot be chance. It's like, yeah, it's soon, but it's going to be longer than we thought. A man goes into another country, and after a long time, he comes back, you see. And the wicked servant says, the master's delayed, and he begins to misbehave. So Matthew is concerned, and also putting together Jesus in a more organized way. Remember, he arranges the sayings of Jesus into five blocks of material. Some people think it's even to mirror like a new Torah or something like that. Luke, people think Luke is very Pauline. If you ask any scholar that's worked on Luke, Luke is hardly Pauline at all, although by that I mean Paul's message in his seven letters. He's very pro-Paul as a remembered hero who goes to the Gentiles. But as far as name groups, Neil, I wouldn't, you know, even figuring it out geographically, you know, like one is Galilee and one is Jerusalem and one is Antioch and one is Alexandria and so forth. I mean, there could be indications of that here and there, but we, we're, we're just in the dark on how all of those things circulate. Uh, but they're all influenced heavily by Paul. You can see that with the Last Supper. You know, Paul's the one who says, I received from the Lord on the night he was betrayed. Mark repeats that. He took bread, he took wine. And we have other Christian sources that don't know anything about that, like the Didache, the teaching of the 12 apostles. And it survives now in Greek, uh, in a Greek manuscript or two. And it has a totally different Eucharist. It calls it the Eucharist, but it's more like a Jewish blessing of bread and wine looking forward to the kingdom. It actually reminds you of what you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they're all Pauline. Uh, the Jamesian branch, or I call him James, he's really Yaakov or Jacob. That branch of the followers of Jesus, they're pretty much over by 70 when the temple's destroyed. James is dead. They're scattered. We think they go to Transjordan. Some of them come back. But I think that day is pretty well past. They don't cease to exist. We know them as the Ebionites, but none of our Gospels are Ebionite. Uh, we have the Gospel of the Hebrews and Gospel of the Ebionites in fragment to pick up on that. So we've got these, what Helmut Kirster called years ago, trajectories of early Christianity. They're trajectories going through time. And you, there's a kind of Gnosticizing trajectory. That would be the Gospel of John. <clears throat> there's a Mark suffering trajectory, probably up until the destruction of the temple. But really, frankly, we have experts on each one of these. Look at the Anchor Bible volumes. Look at the Hermonia commentaries. Often there's not real agreement. For Mark, I would go to uh, Joel Marcus or somebody like that um, probably has the best work on Mark. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm think I'm thinking of uh, Robin Faith <laughs> Walsh's uh, recent work on um, the origins of Christian literature and pointing out yeah. how getting away from like German Romanticism and whatnot on these Gospels, she thinks well educated people would have documented these. That doesn't mean they weren't learning oral tradition or finding about the stories, but it was like Romans or in the Roman empire, people were curious about this guy that they hear rumors of like Jesus. And they're hearing stories from followers and people who've passed down these different narratives and they created a story of their own. Yeah. 
Um, she's not against that idea, but she's like, mm, a lot of this stuff is speculative and then using romanticism. But thank you, oh, Neil. Let me, ask you, let me ask you this. Do you think they liked each other? Everybody assumes because it's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Oh, great. They put them all together. I would guess that Matthew, when you look at how he, <laughs> you know, take this book and just read Mark and read what Matthew does all the way through, side by side. I don't think he likes Mark. Right. Martin right. Smith called it parties and politics of late Second Temple Judaism. It spills on into the first century, you know, beyond the first century, meaning up to the turn. Centuries don't matter, and that's our chronology, but the idea. Now, there's 70 years after Jesus' death by what we call 100 CE. There are five, six, seven, eight streams I would call them spitting cousins, but to think that they're all the same. Now, in the so-called apostolic fathers, you begin to get some attempt to bring down some rule, like just fuddle the bishop. And, you know, so we've got Ignatius and some of the letters of, you know, the Polycarp and so forth. But um, do you think the naming of these gospels, these four gospels, is part of that attempt to try and like not make them enemies, but somehow make them maybe I mean, because yeah. we, you know, these names in in an ancient work, you don't put your name like Josephus doesn't say, My name is Josephus, and I'm gonna write the Jewish war, you know. Uh, maybe on the back there was something of his, say, the Jewish war. Or, now, his life, he does put his name because he's writing his life. The only first-person narrative is Luke, though, right? It seemed good to me, and he doesn't claim to be an eyewitness. He says, I've checked with eyewitnesses. So uh, I, I just don't think we know enough. Um, uh, hasn't McDonald, uh, not only has he done the stuff on Hellenistic literature and all of that, is it, no, maybe it's another scholar. Who, who's the other scholar who has done so much on putting together the New Testament as a canon in its earliest, earliest form, like second century? I can't remember his name right now. But he deals with, you know, copies of manuscripts and so forth. I'm sorry to, I just haven't looked at him in about 10 years and now I can't yeah. think of who it is. I don't know. But I'll, I'll let you know so you can let people know, so. Okay. Thank you, Neil, for that super chat. Constellation Pegasus, Mr. Tabor, with all your researching, what is your conclusion on who Jesus really was? This Jesus, too. I guess I'll, I'll just play with you and say, what Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we did Matthew, Mark. We didn't do John. We did a little bit of Luke. Um, I, I kind of go with the bare narrative, like, if you look at E.P. Sanders, Paula Fridrickson, Bart Ehrman, um, certainly Dale Ellison, we get this kind of core that I would pretty well go with, uh, Galilean uh, peasant who I would say of Davidic line, but I know a lot of them don't go at that, but I would say of Davidic lineage because Paul is our mm -hmm. earliest source. And he says he's, I don't think he would have said he's from the seat of David if he wasn't, because that would be so. Or at least he was claiming to be at least. Certainly right? Claiming, like, yeah. right. So uh, yeah, we can't investigate anybody's DNA back then other than ossuaries, which is another subject. But anyway, um, so I would say, there's that bare bio thing, what he said and what he did. Uh, I think what the Jesus seminar comes up with on what he did, like Robert Funk and people like that, James Strange, there's a whole cluster of scholars that have worked with the archaeology, the texts, and so forth, became a disciple of John the Baptist, joined the movement, was opposed by Herod Antipas, gathered collections of disciples. I would even bring the rabbinic material in here for that. Uh, finally went to Jerusalem, confronted the authorities in the temple, was crucified, was believed by his followers to have ascended to heaven and seated at the right hand of God in glory, you know, apotheosis like Romulus or like Apollonius of Tyana or other 
uh, Greek heroes that are divinized. Um, that's about it in terms of who he was. I probably would come up with more teachings uh, that I'm pretty solid about than a lot of my colleagues. You know, when people say, well, we don't have a clue as to what Jesus ever said. I think there's a there's a kind of a body of material that comes through in the two sayings source. That's mostly teachings, the 60 sayings. There, there's, there's a kind of thematic uh, unity to it um, in terms of it'd be things like God looks at the inside, not the outside. It sounds a lot like Hillel, you know. Uh, don't judge somebody by their race or their gender, you know, but look at them in terms of their heart or their inner self, accepting Gentiles, open to women. You know, you, you can make a whole list of things just by reading some of the te teaching material in the so-called Q source. I would, you know, I, I, I'm a, I could rest with that, that, you know, that, as an individual, he put forth those things. I don't think it's particularly new, though. When I read Amos, Hosea, Jeremiah, uh, particularly those, let me see who else, Micah. You know, what does God really want? He doesn't want sacrifice. He wants the heart. He wants the devotion. He wants justice and righteousness. Uh, cleanse the out inside, not the outside, you know, on and on and on. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't pray to be seen of men. Don't give to be seen of men. On and on and on. There's this body of material. It's really just good spiritual Judaism. You know, you could call it, you know, good spiritual Second Temple Judaism. You get a lot of that in uh, Pirkei Avot, which is one of the tractates of the Mishnah, where you have the ethical teachings of the fathers. If you've never read that, you should read it. You'll be surprised. You'll think, Hmm, this sounds a lot like Jesus because he's coming from that milieu, from that culture. Um, so I guess that's all I could say about who he really was. I certainly think he was a human being. Sometimes my students really press me on, they want to know theologically, like, what do you think about Jesus? So I, I finally came up with this thing. I, I hate to pass it on because it's kind of stark, but I think he's dead and he's not divine. Now to lots of people that would be like, oh, that's Dr. Tabor has no faith. <laughs> what if, you know, let's see, I'm going to be dead. You're going to be dead. Yeah. He was a human being. He died. I'm not divine. You're not divine. He was a human being. That's about and as bad said, as saying to a Catholic, you know, Joseph had sex with Mary. Are you kidding me? No, you didn't. It's but, like but that's in Matthew, right? He knew her not until she brought forth her son. So what does that mean? Yeah. He didn't know her like he what what was your name again? I think we know what that means. <laughs> we know so what that I means. So I don't know. Uh constellation Pegasus. I've seen you before. Uh appreciate the question. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think he he needs to be seen as, uh, you know, Ver Gaze of Aramish is really good. Jesus the Jew. He compares him to, Hon to Honey the Circle Drawer and uh, other charismatic Galilean miracle workers of the time. I got a couple goodies right behind me in Gaze of Aramish. That book is back here, too. It's somewhere in this region. But anyway, I won't waste You know, when, he, when that book came out, believe it or not, people were like, the Jew? I mean, it's like wow. they were shocked at the title. I'd be like, you know, why did, what are you trying to sell books? You calling him a Jew? <laughs> I mean, what, well, what was he, a Muslim? <laughs> oh, Just ask kidding. a Muslim. Yes, they will say it. I well, have yeah, a lot of he was submissive to God, I guess, in his own. That's what, yeah, history. but I'm telling you. Uh. But I should add, and we always have to add this, uh, we have to add he was uncompromisingly apocalyptic. Right. And there I will go to the stake with uh, Schweitzer.
I was, do you know what I was gonna say, Dom? Dom, I like how Dom's open minded to it, but like he said yesterday that there, and I don't want to get caught up in it. You know what I'm talking about? We should do a discussion later on at some point where well, he, you know, he's. I think the reason I can appreciate, I think he's. I don't want to say are moving more towards the apocalypticism, but Dom, as he ages and thinks and meditates, I encourage everybody to listen to that two hour thing yesterday. It's yeah. so profound. You really see that his theism is a process theism. He doesn't mm-hmm. call it that, but it's quote evolution. Right. But what he means by evolution is what I mean by, by white and, and, uh, you know, what we call um, process theism. It's not the God outside, but it's the process that we found ourselves part of has transcendent dimensions. So I think he's more open to the idea of the metaphor. Right. So that even though, no, the end didn't come, but let's don't throw out the baby with the bathwater because maybe we're bringing our own end right now. So yeah, it didn't come in 70 like it sounds like it should have in Mark 13. And immediately in those days after that time, and then you got your full preterists and so forth you know claiming yeah but it did happen he came in the clouds of heaven and the dead were raised and i guess even the people were transformed like first corinthians 15 which i just can't go with Mm -hmm. but i think that's important to add as well so yeah ethical teacher mediterranean peasant there's some stoicism that comes in there but also he thinks the end of the age is near now where he's different i think is he also seems to have this idea, and this is what Dom really picks up on, is the kingdom of God is here and now, as well as something out there that you're waiting for. So that already not yet thing. I uh, wonder if, and I'm not going to say, maybe Paul picked that up from sayings or teachings of Jesus, or maybe the gospel authors are putting Pauline ideas of already, but not yet. I don't know. It's hard for me to put my head on this, but, um, Pat Lowinger, thank you for the super chat. Another unapologetic, uh, unapologetic subject matter expert. Thumbs well, up. Thank you. You know, I feel like I know very little. You know, I was just now forgetting as two men in the tomb or whatever. You know, uh, I pre- you mentioned Robin. I love when she'll say like, "Well, I haven't looked at it. I haven't looked at that in five years. I can't really remember the details <laughs> about the Gospels." Thank you, thank you, because. I mean, I study them so much, but actually for the last 15 years, I've worked more on Paul mm-hmm. and I've got a good knowledge of the gospels because I teach it all the time, but it's, you know, I, I need to refresh myself. Like I couldn't remember the scholar and it's just bugging the hell out of me now. You know how things will come to you <laughs> right after we end. I'll be Derek. I'll call you. Yeah. The guy that, it's more about putting together the New Testament, the actual manuscripts and the papiest stuff and all that. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for that, Pat. Robert Herring, just a teacher's tithe back in middle school. Laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that Thank was you. fun. When the teacher goes, did Jesus tell us? I know the kid, goes, did Jesus tell us? I do this in class with the voices. They love the voices. When I go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to follow you, Jesus, but... You know, first I got to go home and tell my friends. Let the dead bury the dead. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it is. When we're on the phone, this like this, James is just like this. We have fun. So thank you, Robert. I appreciate that. Apollo's Christian Apologetics. Is there ancient precedence for textual oral material being shared, revised in many close sources, like with the Gospels or the Gospels, a unique genre? Oh, look at Talbert, What is a Gospel? It's a book and also articles. Charles Talbert, What is a Gospel? He goes into all that. Um, Gospels, eratologies, and romance literature always seem to overlap a little bit. An eratology is a panegyric that you would write about a hero. We have any number of them in the ancient world. That's always a question. Is a gospel something different? Um, bi- biography. Also, uh, Morton Smith and Moses Hadas 
uh, I forgot the title. You could put it up on Amazon real quick. It's very, very good because he includes text, the actual text. Who is this? Um, Morton Smith, the Morton Smith, and Moses Hadas. I just, the title slips me, but it's something about biographies of divine men or something. But he actually puts those biographies. Um, I took a course, Apollo set at the University of Chicago with Karsten Kolpa, and we did the Alexander romances. And there are three of, there are three lives of Alexander, pseudo callisthenes and so forth. They're not as close as these, you know, like one wrote and then the other 10 years later and the other 10 years later. But they definitely have some overlaps and some, you can compare them. So we did a sort of synoptic study of the three surviving lives of Alexander the Great. And we tried to get at those same kind of elements. But I think what you can say is that each writer wants to give the pitch for his or her version of how the figure should be remembered. You know, the one who doesn't do that very much would be the compiler. You know, like, let's throw everything in, even the kitchen sink, would be uh, Diogenes, Lives of the Philosophers. So you could look that up. It's in the Loeb Classics. And that's a trip because it'll go, let's say you're doing Plato. But it, they're great to read because you're reading all these biographies of the philosophers. I'm glad I thought of that. You guys, if you're interested in this, get Diogenes. This is Diogenes Laertes, not Diogenes of Sinopa. He writes a life of Diogenes of Sinopa, who's the philosopher. Remember the guy who tells Alexander? Mm -hmm. And he goes, what can I do for you, the great Diogenes? Stand out of my light, I'm reading. <laughs> Uh, you want to hear more Diogenes of Sinopa stories? Uh, he's masturbating in the street one day. Yep. And uh, somebody says, that is so disgusting. Why would you do that? He said, well, I'm really starving, and I wish I could rub my belly and get as much satisfaction. Oh. <laughs> I mean, stuff like this. It's it's a little vulgar, but, you know, yeah, hey, yeah. we're in the 21st century. And then the famous one is when he pees on a guy because they're calling him a cynic. Kunos means dog. And he goes, I'm a cynic? Oh, then I need to lift my leg and pee on you then. Oh. You know, like a dog. <laughs> so. But Diogenes Laertes, it's two volumes in the Loeb. Lives of the Philosophers. Go read those. And then read Lucian of Samosata. Because he's the he's the one writer that will make you laugh so hard out loud from antiquity that you, you your your family members will yell, "What is going on in that room? What are you doing?" Because you'll just be like, literally, like, "I can't just <laughs> this is so funny." <laughs> so Alexander the false prophet, remember Alexander the false yeah. prophet who creates a religion and fools oh, everybody. Oh my so gosh. Funny. So you yeah. got to read all this stuff, but what Sinopa, what not Sinopa, what Diogenes Laertes does is he tells you everything anybody ever said. So he's doing Plato. He'll go, well, the Thracians say that Plato was born here, and the so-and-so says this, and then there's a legend of this, and the Dacians say that, you know, it's like, it would almost be, I hate to pick on poor Kermit Sarley again, but Put them all together and yeah, everything we know. But you know what? That's a lot of times what Christians do is in their mind, like Christmas play, quiz. Ready? Apollos, you'll know this. Wise men come from the east, Matthew or Luke. Quick. You'll know it, Derek. Yeah. Uh, shepherds in the fields at night, Matthew or Luke. Because I'm watching a Christmas play. And they got both of those things. Herod kills the innocents, Matthew or Luke, and so forth. In our minds, we put them all together. Empty tomb, same thing. Well, didn't an angel come down and pull the rock back? You know how comments are, Derek, on YouTube. Oh, my God. It's such a trip. 
because people will say, you know, I'll be talking about the ending of the Gospels and so forth, and they'll go, yeah, but it says they sealed it with a rod. I said, it says? What's it? Is there a thing called it? <laughs> Matthew says that. And, you know, in other words, you got to read Matthew as Matthew, Mark as Mark, Luke as Luke, John as John, and then try to understand what is the sum total of our evidence and make some kind of uh, careful, notice I said careful judgments, not critical. I like the word critical, but people always think that means picking things apart, as I said earlier. So, mm. Thank you, Apollos. Get some more coming in here. Derek Shoot. just moved. He's got to pay his light bill or we won't. No, yeah. <laughs> your internet bill. No, we have a lot. We have a lot. We have a lot. I just didn't oh, want to. Yeah, good. we do it. We, obviously, always there's bills. Um, humanist Reformation in Matthew 24, 14, the Greek word oikimene is used that seems to have meant Roman world opposed to world like we understand today. The same term is used in Luke 2, 1. Does it really mean Roman world? Now, I could pull up if you want me to. I could share the screen. and Yeah, that's okay. Pull up um, the verse. You know what it is. It, but I'll pull it up for our audience. Because, because the, you know, because the Roman world is is in some ways sort of the world, um, like preaching to the whole world, to all nations. They're not thinking of South and North America, Asia, Africa, and so forth, even though some of these places were known from spice trading and so forth in the East. But I think they were almost thought of as part of the ancient Near East, as we would say today. Um, I don't think there's a consistency. We have good Greek lexicons. Um, I would recommend you look it up in Arndt and Gingrich, which would be all the Koine Greek words and see what the other references are. I don't, I haven't looked at that lately, but is this, is that the passage in Luke about all the world was being taxed or something yes. like that? Yeah. Yep. I think it could look, you know, oikos means house. Okay. Dwelling. So it's almost like saying the dwellers, all the dwellers of the, among the nations. So, but I think it would depend totally on the context. But the idea that there was a universal tax around the time Jesus was born in every province of Rome, that certainly doesn't seem to be the meaning. So, another problem just to point out in that context there, and what makes it possibly a little bigger than universal or more universal is that this gospel, the kingdom, will be preached in the whole world. You could take that as just the Roman Empire, as a testimony to all nations. Now, right. one could say that this is only in the Roman Empire, but, you know, maybe. Maybe they have that in mind. Um, yeah, and they knew, you know, Claudius had gone, during Paul's day, he had gone up to uh, the UK or Great Britain. Hadrian later has his wall even further up. So they're aware there's a 10 industry from England that's thriving during the Roman period. The Rhine River is kind of a border for Gaul and for the German tribes, but they know they're up there. They know about Scandinavians being further north. Uh, but it's almost like we would say the Western world, the civilized world, they thought of themselves as being like, oh, we're the real world. And then uh, the barbarians that you know, whose language is like blah 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 blah. Those, those people are over there, but uh, right, yeah. So it's hard to say question, exactly, though, but yeah, I think this gets into the full preterist issue, um, where it's oh, okay. It's, it, 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 and I'm not saying humanist reformation has taken that claim, I think he follows our conclusions of failed prophecy, but nonetheless, full. Writers will argue, uh, it didn't fail because it's the Roman world, and uh, or they'll try to, you know, some of the full predators use those arguments anyway. Cheryl, good to see you here. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you because you yeah. did hold that view once. Is there yeah. any evidence that it reached the North African provinces by 70? Um, there's no evidence for Not that. Alexandria and Egypt, but for no, all I don't. Because that would definitely be part of the Roman world, and I don't know that we have any record of anybody preaching. Yeah, we didn't even look at that evidence. What we would do is go look at Paul, and Paul says the gospel had been preached to all creatures or every creature, and we'd look at it, and 
the way it was in English, none of us were speaking or reading in yeah, Greek. Exactly. Paul said something about that all the nations, the gospel has been preached to all the nations or something like that. And yeah, um, but he's still what, what got me and why now that I look back, I'm like, Hold but he's on. still going to Spain. He thinks he right. To, well, if it, it already going. has been, why is he still mm -hmm. on a journey? He, you would think he's yeah. retiring now. All right, it's done. The mission's done, and Jesus is coming back right now. And therefore, I don't have anything else to do. Well, they look. They knew people were north of the Rhine River, and they knew people were, uh, what west of the Nile, mm -hmm. and south of the Nile, and so. Those are people <laughs> right. uh, that still need to be saved, supposedly. And I know there's things uh, past Parthia. They're still, they know about India because the trade comes from India. Yeah, there's just. Well, thank yeah. you, Cheryl, for the super chat. How different is Jesus in his birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension than other gods in ancient history, Romulus or Hercules? Yeah, well, pretty different and pretty similar. <laughs> so I, I'll not answer your question, I guess. The thing <laughs> is, um, we don't have, like Romulus, we have that famous account that uh, Ovid gives it, right? Isn't it an Ovid, I think, about him ascending up and so forth? Yes. But we don't have a bio of him, and he's such a legendary character. I think with Jesus and Hercules also being... Uh, he's so much a part of uh, Greek and Mediterranean legend, whereas these Gospels are written within decades of this figure living. So I think there's much more detail, you know, walking around, going to this city, that city, sailing on the Sea of Galilee. So the differences might be simply um, the kind of records that we have uh, but I would even pick more historical characters than Romulus and Hercules, mm -hmm. you know, more Apollonius of Tyana. Everybody should read that if they haven't, just as a, a bio that will remind you so much of Luke. And I, I would also recommend uh, Apollea, not Apollonius of Tyana, but Apollonius Golden Ass or Metamorphoses about Lucian in his adventures with ISIS religion, because he he's a convert to ISIS, but uh, down in Egypt. But that gives you a good handle on Hellenistic religiosity. So I would say it could just be the records, but also it's set in a Second Temple Jewish context. You know, like we know about Herod's Temple, we know about what the architecture was, and so much about it that we naturally have more context. And then we have Paul's letters and so forth. So it's a matter of records, really. Can, can, I, pl can I play a little teaser that I put together for uh, this whole uh, Apollonius thing? Sure. If people don't mind going more than two hours, which we've done. <laughs> <laughs> people are hanging no, out. Yeah. All right. How many people are watching? It, two? Um, uh, almost 300. Oh, oh come on. Okay, I'm dead serious. Ahead. <laughs> Before he was born, it was known that he would be someone special. A supernatural being informed his mother that the child she was to conceive would not be a mere mortal, but would be divine. He was born miraculously, and he would become an unusually precautious young man. As an adult, he left home and went on an itinerant preaching ministry, urging his listeners to live, not for the material things of this world, but for what is spiritual. He gathered a number of disciples around him who became convinced that his teachings were divinely inspired, in no small part because he himself was divine. He proved it to them by doing many miracles, healing the sick, casting out demons, and raising the dead. But at the end of his life, he aroused opposition and his enemies delivered him over to the Roman authorities for judgment. Still, after he left this world, he returned to meet his followers in order to convince them that he was not really dead, but he lived on a heavenly realm. Later, some of his followers wrote books about him. Everyone meet Apollonius of Tyana. Even before go. that, that one always gets me because Bart Ehrman actually wrote the uh, statement there, and I just oh, took yeah. that and just was. I'm making a little short clip with Bart mm -hmm. Ehrman's, you know, thing about Apollonius of Tyana, and I just thought that was interesting. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Rhett Jet, Dr. Tabor, do you, we know the authors of the Gospels? Was it really Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? Did the authors know Jesus? I think there's general agreement, and I would share this view that we do not know who the authors were. They're anonymous. Even Luke, uh, who uses I, but he doesn't give his name. He does say he's not an eyewitness. Um these are traditional designations. Uh, they began to get used in the second and third century. And then as the canon is put together, did they know Jesus? I, you don't get the idea from, let's take Mark, the earliest. He would be the one to start with. There's never any um, uh, place where the author, the author does address the reader once about a passage in the Apocalypse, Mark 13, where he's referring to Daniel and he doesn't tell you what book. Uh, he just says, uh, let the reader understand. So even then you got to figure it out. <laughs> but, but he never says, and I saw this and I was there and I testify that this is true, as you do in the Gospel of John. Now in John, remember toward the end, you do get this thing about, uh, we know that the witness of this one is true. So even there, they're saying, we, we, it's not our witness, but we know that this person who's passed this on is true, but we don't know who that person is. Uh, the idea that John, son of Zebedee, wrote John, I think is, just doesn't make any sense at all. And the, uh, further, the idea that he's the beloved disciple, I've written a lot about that. And it's either Lazarus or James or Mary Magdalene, maybe, if you want to go with a woman. And if it's Lazarus, Mary Magdalene is probably the same as Mary of Bethany. So, you know, maybe it's a composite idea of some, you know, the intimates of Jesus, the people who are really close to him. But I think it's James because he turns his mother over to his care. And that's what a Jewish boy would do. Eldest boy, when he dies, you know, pass on the mother to the next in line, which is James. And also James is in charge of the community and lives in Jerusalem. And so the idea that Mary would not be in his care makes no sense at all. So what's the proof of that? Paul goes up to visit James and uh, all of our traditions, Stephen Schumacher's done the most on the Mary traditions. He shows that very strong, oh, this idea that Mary went with John to Asia Minor and lived at Ephesus and that sort of thing. That's another John, apparently, but uh, uh, it's going too far afield for tonight. So, Thank you, anyway. Rhett. Yeah. Constellation Pegasus, and we'll blast through these, Dr. Tabor, because it's getting late where you're at. And you know, your apotheosis is supposed to happen sometime in the I next I just want a glass of wine or something. So that's, <laughs> Do you, you want to know it? I can go get one. I think that's allowed on YouTube. But I'm Would you? I, I don't think it's a problem, but uh, if you want to grab Yeah, I see glass. Constellation's question. Great donation. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank I think you mean the RSV, not the ESV, but yes, absolutely. Uh, I talk about that in my translation, my translation of Genesis. I did a blog post for Bart Ehrman's blog, if you remember there, uh, and also on my blog, jamestaber.com. It's called Lost in Translation, and I give the story of the burning of the RSV. Here it is. It's it's the translation I normally use. This is my brand new one. When I retired, I got a new one. You might, I want you to all see. Oh, my God, he's never even studied or opened this. My old one's in the closet, and if I pulled it out to prove how I read the Bible, it's, it's literally gone, but this is the same thing. So, yeah, they were just so upset at two things, uh, not putting virgin for young woman in Matthew's birth story. Uh, you know, they, they are rather putting young woman for virgin. I'm sorry, I misspoke. You know, a young woman will conceive because it doesn't have the word virgin in Greek. And then also, uh, or I mean, in, uh, in Greek it does, but not in the quotation. 
from Isaiah, and then Mark 16. In the new version, because they want to sell RSV still, they mark it off with a space, and, and then they have the longer of the fake versions, but they put a little note saying this many authorities think this is later. So it's still there because it's right. the favorite of evangelicals. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, baptize, pick up snakes, drink poison, speak in tongues. I mean, if you take away that, what happens to the charismatic movement in the Appalachians, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but it, it's, 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 look at my blog because, uh, I have a great post, I think, uh, here I am bragging on my own things, but greatly title post the original ending of Mark and why it makes all the difference. So it's defending the idea that you want, please let Mark end the way he wants. Imagine if you were a filmmaker, say you're Bergman or any great filmmaker that's really classic you know, and you've made your film and then somebody comes along and says, yeah, but I'm going to re I'm going to use that, but I'm going to put a different ending. You can't do that. You can't put a different ending in the Mark 16 ending, the fake, there are three, actually four. If you count them all, I think Bart said there were four, but there are three that are in the RSV. One of them is so fake that you would laugh if I read it. Do you want me to read it? No, well, go read it. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, and they preached the everlasting gospel in every nation and everybody believed and glory, hallelujah. And, you know, it's all wonderful. I mean, it's just like somebody just wrote some kind of theological thing. But the, mar the one that everybody has in the King James, it's in most manuscripts, but late. It's later. It's a composite of Matthew, Luke, and John. Read it. Literally, it's like a little bit of Matthew, a little bit of Luke, a little bit of John. They're even in order. So somebody just thought, you know, he needs a better ending. I don't want to make it up. But since Matthew had a good ending, Luke had a good ending about the men from Emmaus and so forth. And John has a real good ending about the Sea of Galilee. I'll just put those in. And that's what he does. And he's got the Great Commission, of course. Preach the mm. gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved and so forth. So, Right. Thank you, Constellation. William Martin says, The violent imagery in Luke that predicts that family members will turn against one another because of theological and sectarian differences related relating to Jesus Christ sadly seems a prophecy fulfilled. Yeah, that's true. Thank you, uh, William. Th throughout the history of religion, unfortunately, right? Yeah. Families, nations, kingdoms. Boy, it's so bad what people have done to one another. That's true. Nadav, uh, native, forgive me if I butcher your name. What's the relationship between Nadav, Genesis? Maybe. Nadav. Nadav. Yeah. Uh, between Genesis 2 through 4 and the theologies, Paul's in the New Testament, Hellenistic or Persian influence, Philo of Alexandria. I'm confused. Uh, the main, look, I think the main way Paul gets into Genesis 2 through 4, 4 actually, yeah, that would be this Garden of Eden stuff. That would mm -hmm. be with his second Adam thing, I think. Uh, I see that as more coming out of Second Temple Judaism somehow. But I think Persian influence, Hellenistic influence, and then Philo, maybe not as separate, but also influenced by those. Uh, it's just a, uh, it's, it's kind of a swimming pool of uh, mixtures of culture during the Roman period. So Paul is very Hellenized, so is Jesus, so is every form of Judaism that I know of if you define Hellenism as a sort of dualism that's mainly concerned with the world to come, eternal life, 
religions that are looking to the heavenly world, the expanded cosmos, doing something beyond death in the expanded cosmos, as opposed to Gilgamesh, as opposed to the Hebrew Bible, where you die and go to Sheol, you're a human being, it's not your place, you don't belong in heaven, you might visit there and you're going to get knocked back down, you know, you can't stay, that's the big shift. And that's what makes the Hebrew Bible kind of unique in that it's our, you know, everybody's not reading Gilgamesh anymore and all of the ancient Near Eastern texts and even the Egyptian texts of the earlier period. It's a life in the tomb. If there's any life at all, it's in the tomb. And it's it's a shadowy, you know, look at uh, Plato's Republic, book 10, uh, where Odysseus goes down to the underworld, look at Gilgamesh. I cover all of that in the book you held up, Derek, if you have it handy, Paul's Ascent to Paradise. The second chapter is about the Hellenistic influence on Paul's theology. So I wouldn't say it's Genesis directly, but Genesis has to be used and reinterpreted as it is with Philo. It has to be. Because otherwise, how could you be, have the foundational book of beginnings not reflect the whole purpose of the cosmos? Well, it doesn't. Dust you are, to dust you will return. However, there is the tree of life. However, remember Gilgamesh. He gets the plant, right? He mm -hmm. gets the plant that will give you eternal life. And a snake eats it. And then what? Yep. He dies. So, yes, they could dream of a, tree, a lost tree that could have given them eternal life. But that's a story basically saying, as Bob Dylan would put it, it ain't you, babe. You're not a god. <laughs> You're a human. You know, remember the Nakash, I call him not Satan, the, the, not even a snake, the gleaming one, the Nakash. He says, you will be as gods. Uh, but he doesn't say have e having eternal life. But Yahweh then says, we got to get them out of here. It's kind of a like a heavenly dwelling, right? Got to get them out of this garden. Because they could go eat the tree and live forever. It's very, very parallel to the idea of the Gilgamesh. Like Gilgamesh is going to get the secret from Nepash's team and his wife, who are on this island of the blessed, you know, and they're living forever. But that's a, the exception. But he's going to get it, and he doesn't. He loses it. So Genesis is basically a story of how humans don't get it. And I would say all the way through the Hebrew Bible, um, I know you can find some verses where you say, you know, if, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there, or something like that. Well, God, in the Hebrew Bible, in some texts, fills heaven and earth. But you can't show me a text where people come out of Sheol, uh, except Daniel 12, maybe Isaiah 24, 26. Remember that little Isaiah apocalypse? That seems to be just stuck in Isaiah because it's got all that cosmic stuff about you know, thy dead will live, my dead body will rise, who's my? It's very confusing in Hebrew and in the Septuagint. There's no eternal life in the Hebrew Bible, basically, but it's coming in fast in the Hellenistic period. Yeah. And thanks to Persian, probably influence as well. But Persian, thank heavy, heavy influence. Thank you. Thank you for that. Cheryl, again, says, I think Derek should move his camera and give us a tour of his new studio. Uh, it's empty in here. Uh, You're not going to see my room because I cleaned it up. So <laughs> you can tell I still have to uh, unpack here. Um, yeah. There is a room back there. So, James, if you ever come to visit, you do have your own bedroom down here. I like um, that you have all this space, though. This is incredible. Yeah. yeah. And then there's a, like a kind of a little kitchen area. Wow, so this is nice. Very nice. Keep, keep my Gatorades in the fridge, and then you can see I'm going to put a TV up there in case I'm ever bored and 
want to watch some TV. But this is the studio downstairs. It even has its own bathroom, full bathroom, the whole nine. You could wash your sins in. You know what I mean? The whole nine. But uh, yeah, Cheryl, thank you for the uh, demanding me to move my camera around. I am just, I literally put what I thought was most important was just make sure I have my bookshelves up and ready. And then um, you froze on us. Is your internet good there so far? Have you found it to be good? Um, I'm not hardwired like I was at my okay. old house. I've got to get my Ethernet cable and hook yeah. it up. I literally threw this thing together uh, other right. than making sure I put my books back up and stuff because I miss them. I haven't seen them in months. Mm. And uh, anyway, yeah, thank you for that super chat, Cheryl. I really appreciate that. Cheryl's always so good. I've watched her now for over a year with you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Helping out. And Inquisitive mind, did Arabs visit the Jewish temple before 70 AD? Arab, well, certainly Arab, people from Arabia can go to the temple, if that's what you mean. I'm not sure. I guess the question is, did they? I mean, they can, but did they go to the temple? Were were there Muslims, I guess you'd say, if you want to oh, be a Muslim? That's the problem is like, I think this is going to get into the topic of well, it depends on what you mean by Muslim. If you mean the religion as what solidified or codified by the prophet Muhammad, then obviously, obviously that's not later. unless they're time travelers like an outlander or something. I, but I, remember Herod married the daughter of an Arab and he himself, his mother is Arab. And so Herod's mother is mentioned quite often in Josephus, and she certainly can go to the temple. So it really depends on what's behind the question. So, yeah, and but I don't all, all, uh, all Gentiles can go to the temple. They can't, the court of the Gentiles is huge. Many football fields, if you've been up there, I'll take you there, yeah. Eric. Your, your eyes are going to pop out when you really see how big it is. <laughs> I mean, it, it is vast. Can I walk past into the court of the Jews and not be killed today? Absolutely. But you can't go in the Dome <laughs> of the Rock anymore. Right. And that's actually, uh, Dome said last night in 67, before then he used to go. I went in the Dome of the Rock in the 90s when I took my students. We used to sit in there for hours. This stopped fairly recently, and it had to do with some incidents where the Israelis felt the security was not tight enough up there because there were different kinds of uh, violent acts going on, uh, throwing things off the top down onto the Jews praying at the wall. And so wow. they took over the security. Notice when you go up, you go through Israeli security, not Muslim security or Palestinian. And so the, Temple authorities, or the, actually, they don't call it the temple, of course, the Haram, they said, well, then no more tourists can go in the dome. It was almost like a, you won't let us do security, then we won't let you go in the dome. Like, it's going to kill tourism, which it hasn't really killed tourism, but people would like to go in the dome. And by the yeah. way, it is gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. Wow. I've been in there many, I used to go and sit there for hours because it's just such a peaceful place, right Thank in the you. Jerusalem. Thank you for the question, Ghost of Myth Vision. I'm not sure exactly where you're going with it, but I suspected. Let I me, let me tell you this, too, that uh, Jews in the 1800s had placemats in their homes in the Jewish quarter with the Dome of the Rock on the placemat because they saw it as a protection for the stone of Abraham, Moriah. They didn't see it. Uh, it's not a mosque. People think it's a mosque. It's not a mosque. It's a it's a shrine or a covering to protect the rock. That's why it's called Dome of the Rock. You follow? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't. It didn't have that political connotation uh, until more modern times. You know, with the conflicts post. Post wow. uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for that. Constellation Pegasus again. Thank you for that wonderful super chat. Why didn't the gospel writers demand their names be recognized as the authors? How did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John get in them? I don't have that right at the top of my head. I studied it in grad school and I've read over the years. Um, that's why I'm trying to think of this scholar's name that does the best work on it. It's, it's sort of like the making of the, not the canon, but the, just the idea of the New Testament itself beginning to get put together. Um, but often works do not have the name ancient works in, in, within the work itself. So that could be part of the answer. Like if I pull a copy of Jewish War here, let's see. Uh, keep talking. Keep getting another one while I pull this. Do, 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 do. No, you got to pull another thing because I'm reading. <laughs> okay, okay, while you, you do Jewish that. War, here's how you start an ancient book. And this was at the same time, 73, starting an ancient book. My name is Josephus. You ready? The war, <laughs> book one, the war of the Jews against the Romans, the greatest not only of the my, wars of our time. So there you complete, go. I got this one right here. So. Yeah. So he doesn't say, I'm Josephus, and I was this, and I was that. And sometimes he, actually, I'm wrong. As he goes on, he does introduce himself. I repent in dust and ashes. I, maybe I'm thinking of the antiquities, but <laughs> I'm wrong. <laughs> he did. He did. Because he uses the first person a lot. That's the difference. Right. See, he, he's like the author of Luke in the preface. Josephus constantly talks about himself. I forgot that. I'm slipping in my old age. Yeah, he mentions himself all the time. Like he tells yeah. about his surrender, meeting Titus, Vespasian. So he did use his name. But let's let's try this again. Antiquities. Does he say, I think he uses the first person in antiquities too. So like probably to start out. Some other work. I've got it. Antiquities, right here. book one, preface. So this is the family from which oh, I no. He loves himself. He tells about his great family and his pedigree. Yep. Okay. My so grandfather if, was named Simon with the addition. Yeah, if, yeah. if you're writing in the first person, that would be another now I'm going to reverse myself and act like my lapse in memory was a virtue, which is always is. helpful. Uh, if you're writing in the first person and you're going to tell a lot of things that you did, like say Mark said, oh, and also I remember going into the house with him and we had some fish after he healed the paralytic and I'll never forget it. It was tasting really good. And you get that kind of thing in Josephus all the time. Also in antiquity. So Let's try to think of a work that is giving a narrative of a famous figure, and we know who wrote it, maybe, but the name is not inside the book. And I would have to go to my other library to pull, but we're way over time, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Rhett Jet says, with the flood myths and so many civilizations, does the this imply one ancient flood or localized flood stories around civilizations next to bodies of water? The way to get out of that is I have no expertise in anything before the Maccabean period. No, <laughs> no before Alexander the Great. But uh, I imagine it, it, it's yeah a, around the Black Sea. There's some pretty different books have appeared and other things that would indicate uh, flooding between the Black Sea, Mesopotamia down to the Caspian Sea, and are, are down to the Gulf rather, you know, with the mouth of the rivers, of the four rivers. Um, flooding seems to be something that happened. I think there's several books that have come out about that, yeah. you know, that's, particularly the Black Sea. But uh, I really haven't traced flood legends much. I mean, everybody knows about the ancient Near Eastern ones, Enuma Elish and all of those, but I don't, you know, I remember hearing when I was a kid growing up, because I got the same apologetics that a lot of you did, 
was Haley's Bible Handbook or something like that. And it would go like, there are over 230 flood legends. The Polynesians yeah. say a man in a boat, this and that. And I always wondered what the sources for those were because missionaries had gone to those places and preached and left Bibles. And, you know, you just, but this was just like a list. And that would prove this and that. And it's the same thing you see about, have you ever seen this thing that circulates on the internet? There were 12 gods born of a virgin who yeah, yeah, yeah. executed and rose from the dead on the third day before Jesus. And you go like, oh, really? Uh, let's list them out. And what are you always have to say, what are the sources? Right. Like, did you know that Jesus as a kid used to go with Joseph of Arimathea, who was a tin merchant and visit the British Isles? Uh, and <laughs> Glastonbury has the traditions of, and you go like, when was that first told? And somebody goes, I think it was 1450 or something like that. And you go like, okay, thank you. Yeah. Or Mary Magdalene is in France and she has a baby and she's married there and they fled in a boat. And when was that first told? I'm not making fun of Mary Magdalene legends, believe me, because I'm actually very interested in her. But I just always have to ask what it, because I think she was a, a real founder, a, a really important figure who's been muted in early Christianity. But I'm talking about when you jump 500, 800, 1,000 years and then start telling the legends of a culture in France or England. For me as a historian, I just... I just have to say, well, that was the lore of the time, but I, I can't right. jump back to the, the Roman period with things like that. So, Thank you, Rhett. And the last one, Constellation Pegasus. Uh, was the word homosexual first put in the Bible in 1946? The, you think of the RSV again? I would imagine. I don't, I don't know. The RSV, let's look, it would be 1 Corinthians 6. There's descriptions of men with men in Romans 1, but you're talking about the word, let's see. Right, that specific word. Uh, no, they, they, they're two words, and they translate both words together as sexual perverts. That's the RSV. I think think this is but whether this is the 46 edition i don't know i don't have i have a 46 edition but i don't have it here at home you can i'm sure google that and find out um yeah i um, want to ask you james and and thank you for spending extra time here tell us why does everyone need to go subscribe to your blog well you'll get updates of Anything that's posted, the newsletter is monthly, and you can see there where you sign up for that. Your emails are never shared, so totally secure. And it's a secure site. It's H, what is it, TTPS and so forth. You can see the uh -huh. little seal of approval down there. But the main thing would be the search feature up at the top, or you can go all the way up and do it, or it's actually the first thing. Search using keywords to the right there. Type in almost anything, and you're going to find 20 or 30 major entries that are not just little blog entries like what I did this morning or something like that, but they'd be like 15, 20 pages of all kinds of literature and discussions. I'm thinking of publishing... Uh, an anthology of some of the best posts that would become a little book, you know, just like you have chapters in a book that are on random topics. Cause I spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours writing these blog posts with a lot of, uh, and the YouTube channel, I'm going to reorganize it. Once you get over a hundred videos and I'm way over a hundred now, <laughs> I did it by type. And I think, uh, and Derek has the same challenge. Like, how do you, how do you let people find things? I mean, you can do a search, but I think I'm going to go topical actually. Like right now it's, it's more genre, like interviews, lectures, that kind of thing. But, 
I'm going to post this just so everybody in the chat, it is in the description, but sometimes people just don't know how mm -hmm. to find that. And let me also do the jamestabor.com um, for people who are just needing a button to click. Here it is. Um, also your books. I have all of the recommended books down in the recommended book list. You can go and get all of his copies of his works there. And you also are on Audible. A couple of the uh, books you have are on Audible. Go check yeah, it out. The Simon & Schuster books are Audible. The others, uh, Why Waco may or may not, I don't think it is. That's about the Waco 1993. There's also a book called A Noble Death that's out of print. But um, if you want to start with my stuff, if you're new to me, I would start with the Jesus Dynasty. I mean, that's, yeah, that's my amazing. magnum opus on Jesus when I was 60 years old. And I'm, I'm 76 now. So I don't hold all the views the same. You know, people <laughs> change. That's a good thing. But Paul and Jesus picks up with a lot of additional things. And then Jesus discoveries about the Talpiot tomb. Paul's ascent to Jesus. Book of Genesis is just something I did over the years. I, I got so frustrated with poor translations and decided to give it a try based Thank on you. the Hebrew Bible. So I, I love Paul and Jesus. I love the Jesus dynasty. I love Paul's ascent. I mean, if you paperback or audible, either way, the people who read it are really good. So if you're one of those who has to drive and listen, audible, check out his books. And of course, get true salvation. Join MythVision's Patreon. In fact, I might as well let him know, Dr. Tabor is also on the Patreon uh, list. So you're one of my patrons, and I hope I that am. people will come. In. Yeah, yeah, come join us. I mean, look, I, I had to I had to take a jab at William Lane Craig on that one. Um, but yeah, go. This one hasn't been made public. There's just a bunch of them that if you dive in, you'll see I have a lot of content there that I haven't made public. And if you scroll down and hit next, hundreds i don't know there's probably like 70 80 hit next uh of videos that you can go through that are out on the page so how many videos are on your your total on my your YouTube? youtube channel and your patreon like 800 or something or? i think i have about a thousand videos on pay on youtube so your people have to just keep up or scroll just well you can do a search so I guess you yeah can search yeah yeah, I, there's like a thousand. I don't oh, know. We've got some good ones coming out. We've got, um, we remember, we have some really provocative titles. The Day Judaism oh. Was Born. We got that one. That one's we, fun. We yeah, got yeah, the, yeah. the crucified Maccabean king Antigonus and his DNA. We got a whole bunch of stuff coming out later. So I know. I got to edit those. And especially the one on the the birth of Judaism uh, as we know it, uh, I'm going to have the to. Oven of yeah. Yeah. The <laughs> oven of Acme. Yeah. The oven of Acme. Judaism was born over an argument about an oven. Yeah. And should it be one piece? Can it, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that gets involved. It's really fun. Uh, Dr. Tabor, any what final is this? words? James looks good. 476. What What is this 476? Like, I don't look good, but 476. Where is this at? Oh. I'm just kidding. I just, <laughs> I just I just turned on the chat. I hadn't even looked at it. So well, any final words from you? Any any positive? No, I just uh, mainly you know the world is my classroom. I really feel that now. And um I am gonna teach. Have you heard of Le Mood University in Peru? Mm -hmm. In Lima, Peru. L-I-M-U-D. You can Google it. They have me teaching a course in October. It's eight lessons. It's all online, but they it'll be translated into Spanish as I teach. So that's going to wow. be interesting. So My buddy's from Lima, Peru. Really? Well, Eric, yeah. Eric Romeo, you might know. know um, Spanish. So anybody yeah. who, what, but I'm going to do it in English. They're going to translate it. But that's in October. If you go to Limud, just Google it, L-I-M-U-D. In Hebrew, that means student. Yeah, Bart. Uh, no, Amy Jo Levine has done one. I think a bunch of people that you interview have done them. 
and I guess I was recommended. So my course is called, my first course, I plan to do several, is what kind of a Jew is Jesus? So you could sign up for that. I don't know what it costs, but, um, and then, but I really see all of you as my classroom. I, I'm, I miss my students, but after 43 years of teaching, you know, without a break, I'm ready for the break and mostly for the freedom. And I have so much in my archives and my files. I'm just beginning. I've got to finish this book on Mary, The Lost Mary. It's out in French. If you read French, you can read it now, but that's going to be pretty major. And then uh, then I've just got all the stuff that I've collected for all these years. And I want to try to present it through YouTube, but in a good way. And I'm going to start doing all kinds of things. So. Well, I hope everybody stays connected with you through the blog, checks out your YouTube, subscribes to the channel, and stays tuned. In fact, and who's uh, going to listen to a three hour video, Derek? Anybody? There are lots of people. You would be shocked. <laughs> you would be shocked. Well, I know you do it sometimes with your friends. Yeah. So we'll try to get Robert Kuhn sometime with the three of us closer to truth. See, I like oh, to do. Yeah. I love to do philosophical stuff. It's totally out of my field, and I have no expertise other than my intellect and mind thinking about life and existence and existentialism. And right. but I've read a lot, like everybody, in science and religion. And so, sometime we'll get all of your buddies together, gal, guys and gals, and uh, I'll come on with you and just kick around all of the questions you guys like to talk about transcendence, consciousness, evolution. Oh. And see, I won't be an expert. So you guys can right. just like, correct. I'm me. not an expert in anything. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I totally, I'm with you. I'm with you. Everybody like this video, comment on this video, go support our guest, Dr. James D. Tabor, get the books, Check out his YouTube channel. Join the blog. Be on the lookout. We're going to have a tour in Israel, walking the footsteps of Jesus and where he would have walked. We call it tracking Jesus. Tracking Track, Jesus. Tracking him. We're going to be going checking out some. Just stay tuned, and it's going to be in great, great video quality. So if you're wanting to take that tour with us, we'll have that course available. I call it a course, but it's really like an online virtual tour where you get taught by Dr. Tabor at all of these various sites as we walk through Israel and stuff. So Dr. Tabor, thank you for your time. Yeah. And let me just say on the tour, I'm going to do it every March. It's usually in March, but because of COVID, we kept, we we're going to do it this March and we couldn't get in. So that's mm -hmm. why it's October, but in the future, every March. So many YouTube people have already written me and said, when, you know, when's the next tour? But uh, my guess is once you put out those, that course and people see what they're going to experience, it fills up fast now, but I mean, it fills up like in a month or two. Right. I, I'm kind of picturing it filling up like in an hour or two in the future. So, but I'll let you know whenever we release the info on that. Take care, Derek. Thank you, Dr. Tabor. So glad and you're safe and you're with your family. And I am. I know I've, I've done a lot of moving in my life over the years. I was, my dad is in the service, you know, he's like yours, mm -hmm. Air Force. And uh, I don't know how many times we move, but at different school for every year of high school. That gives you a clue. So, Yeah, it's a lot. Thank you. Never forget, we are Myth Vision. Mm -hmm.